An SCP Foundation doctor wearing a hazmat suit is escorted by two guards through the secure facility. They stop in front of a large, sealed door, and one of the guards scans his security card. There's an audible hiss as the door slides open. The doctor nervously looks to the guard who motions him inside. They certainly won't be joining him. The doctor steps into the small airlock, and the door snaps shut. A complicated locking mechanism seals the door behind him. He's truly locked in. The reverse process then begins on the locked door in front of him. It finishes, and the door opens, revealing a room with bright lights that briefly blind the doctor. As his eyes adjust, he can see that the entire room is white and bathed in an intense light. He steps out of the airlock and towards the center of the room where his task awaits. He takes one slow step at a time, pausing for a moment after each before taking the next. The doctor wants to get this over with as quickly as possible, but he has to abide by the protocols, and this is how they dictate that one must walk in this containment chamber. As the doctor gets closer to the center, and his eyes further adjust to the bright light, he can finally see what this room contains. In the very middle of the room, directly under the lights, is a man. He's lying on a table and isn't moving at all, except for his slow, rhythmic breathing, which is assisted by the ventilator he's connected to. A feeding tube has been placed inside his nose, and numerous machines next to the man hum and beep as they measure his vital signs. The doctor continues to take one slow step after another, and eventually, after what feels like an eternity, he reaches the middle of the room. The lights above the man are angled to create large, dark shadows coming off of him, and now the doctor is finally close enough to make out what he was warned about in his briefings. Even though the man is completely still, the shadows are moving. Scurrying on the edges of the man's shadow are what look to be spiders, and big ones too, roughly three inches across. But the doctor can't see any actual spiders on the man. Only the shadows of these massive arachnids are visible as they move back and forth along the man's shadow. The doctor is growing increasingly nervous. He can feel the sweat dripping down the inside of his hazmat suit, though he tries to tell himself it's just a result of the bright lights beating down on him. The doctor reaches the machines measuring the man's vital signs and jots down their readings, marking down that the man's medically induced coma appears stable. He's continually distracted from his work, though, by the movement of the spiders. One suddenly jumps from one part of the man's shadow to another, startling the doctor and causing him to jump back. The spiders abruptly stop moving, and even though he can't see their eyes, he has the feeling that they are looking right at him. The doctor is frozen with fear, staring right back at the spiders. But after a moment, they go back to their previous behavior and start crawling along the edge of the comatose man's shadows once more. The doctor continues to go down his checklist and audibly gulps. He's reached the final item, the one labeled physical exam. Nervous sweat runs down his face into his eyes, and he wishes he wasn't wearing this hazmat suit so he could wipe it off. He knows he must get much closer to the man, and more importantly, his shadow, than he feels comfortable with. He has to physically take the man's pulse, though. They won't let him out of this room if he doesn't. He reaches out towards the man's hand, slowly and carefully. He can see the shadow of his hand getting dangerously close to the man's shadow, and the spiders. One of the spiders stops moving, as if it is watching and waiting for the doctor's shadow to get closer. It raises up on its hind legs looking like it is ready to pounce. The doctor gets closer and closer to the man's hand, when out of nowhere, the room is rocked by an explosion. The doctor spins around, and on a monitor next to the airlock door, he can see a feed of the hallway outside. The guards who had escorted him run down the hall as a red emergency light flashes. He turns back to the man on the table. The spider that was waiting for him lowers itself out of its attack mode and goes back to scurrying along the shadow. The room is shaken by an even bigger explosion, and it suddenly goes dark. The power must have gone out from whatever is happening outside. He can hear the sound of muffled gunfire mixed with far-off screams, but both are drowned out by his nervous, heavy breathing inside of the suit. The doctor drops to the ground and tries to crawl back to the door, but he has no idea which direction it is. He hits his head hard and hears a crack come down his mask. That must have been the table. The doctor turns and crawls the other direction, eventually finding the airlock door. He stands up and bangs and pulls on the door, but it won't move. He fumbles with his hazmat suit and finds the button for his emergency light. A chemical light comes on inside of his suit, 
casting his face in a sickly yellow light. But the light starts to flicker. Something must be malfunctioning. The light on one side of his protective mask goes out, leaving half of his face in darkness. But that's the least of his problems, because all of his attention is now focused on the shadow moving across his face. It's the shadow of a spider. His eyes go wide as the spider stops and stands up on its rear legs. Arachnophobia, the fear of spiders, and sciophobia, the fear of shadows, are some of the most common phobias, and today's SCP file is a terrifying and dangerous combination of both. I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-538, also known as the Shadow Spiders. SCP-538 is what appears to be a kind of living shadow, not dissimilar to SCP-017 though these shadows always take the form of an unknown species of spider. These anomalous arachnids seek out the shadows cast by other living objects, attaching themselves to the edge of the living creature's shadow in such a way that their own shadows aren't obscured. Once attached to a shadow, the spiders will appear to feed off of them. This allows them to rapidly grow in size, with adults measuring a total area of roughly 15 square centimeters. Once they reach their full size, they will continue to feed though this will only maintain their size. The feeding process seems to not impact the host in any way, and the spiders can remain on a shadow indefinitely. While the spiders have been observed feeding on the shadows of inanimate objects when no living creatures are available, these don't appear to provide the spiders with whatever nutrients they require, and they will slowly atrophy and decrease in size. It is only when they are connected to the shadow of a living organism that SCP-538 can thrive. SCP-538 are not locked to the shadow they are on, though. The spiders have shown the ability to move across areas to reach a new host, though they will decrease in size when not attached to a shadow, losing as much as two square centimeters of their size for every second that they aren't on a shadow. And should they be stranded in the open without a shadow to feed on, they will decrease in size until they disappear completely, at which point that individual instance of SCP-538 is considered to be terminated. The spiders normally avoid this fate thanks to their extremely fast movement though, and fully grown instances have been measured moving up to 1 meter per second. While SCP-538 instances are usually quite benign, seeming content to simply live on the shadow of their host, they will attack if they are frightened, which is when the real danger presented by these anomalous arachnids comes to light. If the spiders are agitated, usually from the result of a rapid movement by its host, the spider will bite the organism's shadow before attempting to flee. Once bitten, the unlucky individual will progress through five distinct stages, all of which take place over the course of roughly one hour. During the first, the subject will report pain in the area of their body that corresponds to the part of their shadow that was bitten, but no puncture wounds or other marks will be visible in this location. Minor psychological effects have been reported in this stage, mostly consisting of an increase in irritability and the tendency for the bitten subject to lash out at those around them. The second stage occurs 10 to 15 minutes after being bitten. The subject will begin sweating, despite reporting that they feel cold, while their skin will become red and warm to the touch. 25 to 30 minutes after the bite, the third stage will begin. At this point, the psychological effects become very noticeable, with the subject becoming violent and attempting to attack any person nearby. Their speech will be slurred, and they may show signs of impairment to their motor skills. The fourth stage begins at the 40 to 45 minute mark, and at this point, the subject's skin color will go from being red to a pale white as their core temperature drops 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. Their psychological state will alter once again and they will go from being extremely aggressive to overly apologetic, blaming their previous behavior on the fact that they weren't feeling well and weren't acting like themselves. After offering their apologies, they will then request their leave from the area and attempt to retreat to a darkened area. The fifth and final stage happens 55 to 60 minutes after the bite, at which point the subject faces a grisly end to the entire ordeal. Their entire body will rapidly dissolve into a translucent liquid while at the exact same time, their shadow will disintegrate into numerous smaller instances of SCP-538. The spider offspring measure just 4 centimeters across, and the new instances will immediately begin seeking out shadows of their own that they can attach to and feed off of. There is currently no known cure for being bitten by an SCP-538 instance, and even death will not halt the process. 
Instead, should the subject expire while in the earlier stages of the condition, death will cause the final step to occur immediately. In a bit of good news, only bites to the area of an individual's shadow that correspond to a spot of bare skin seem to cause these effects. Even thin materials like cotton clothing appear to be enough to prevent the process from starting. The SCP Foundation has multiple instances of SCP-538 in containment, and they are kept in a white 15 by 15 by 3 meter room that is accessible only via an airlock. Four 200 watt lights are focused on a table in the center of the room, where D-class personnel in a medically induced coma is kept in a stable state, in order to serve as a feeding source for the SCP-538 specimens. No other sources of shade are allowed into the room, so that the D-class serves as the only source of shadows. Any personnel that enter the room, whether to repair a light source or to check on the condition of the D-Class, are to wear sealed hazardous material suits equipped with oxygen tanks, and are advised that they must move slowly and deliberately in order to avoid agitating any instances of SCP-538. Initially, doctors sent to examine the D-Class personnel were allowed to enter the room alone. However, following the events of Incident I-538-1, that protocol has been changed. During the incident, an attack by the Chaos Insurgency caused disruptions to both the main and backup power sources to the part of the site where the SCP-538 containment cell is located. Just as a Foundation doctor was in the middle of an examination of the comatose D-Class, power outage led to all lights in the containment cell shutting off, while at the same time sealing the airlock that provides the only means in or out of the room and trapping the doctor inside. The power was not able to be restored to the containment cell for another 18 hours, at which point the doctor was finally removed from the cell. The doctor sobbed uncontrollably as he kept repeating that he could feel them crawling all over him. The doctor was required to attend mandatory psychological therapy for his newly developed arachnophobia and was later reassigned. Following this incident, the examination protocol was updated and health checkups of the D-Class personnel are now performed by a doctor who is accompanied in the cell by two security personnel, each of whom are equipped with two 250-watt flashlights that can be used in the event of another disruption to the lights. If at any time a staff member is bitten by one of the spiders, they are to be immediately placed within SCP-538's containment cell as soon as possible, as the failure to properly contain them could easily lead to a massive containment breach by SCP-538 entities. Bitten individuals will often attempt to hide the fact that they are bitten, so anyone who comes into contact with the shadow spiders must be carefully monitored for signs of any of the symptoms that follow a bite. The ease with which they could quickly spread, and the huge threat they pose to humanity, has led to SCP-538 being classified as Euclid. And while the Foundation hopes that they have been successfully contained, we all must remain ever vigilant of movement on the edge of shadows. Should you spot something, don't take any chances. Your future, non-liquefied body will thank you for it. A pair of urban explorers are standing in front of a rather creepy-looking public school building. One explains to the other that it has been abandoned for years, though no one in the town seems to know exactly why. The two pull a board off one of the windows and climb through. The inside looks pretty much like they were expecting. Their flashlights reveal that years of squatters, teens partying, and wild animals have left plenty of refuse and debris lying around. There are two wings branching off the central portion of the building. They pick one of them to explore and start walking down the hall. As they make their way down past the graffiti-tagged walls, they stop to investigate one of the classrooms. It looks to be in the same bad state as the rest of the building, but incredibly, they're still writing on the chalkboard, as if the teacher stopped in the middle of a lesson and walked out. There's even a shriveled old apple still on the desk. As they exit the classroom back into the hallway, one of them stops. Wasn't the graffiti on the wall different before? Impossible, they must be mistaken. They keep walking and come to a stairwell. Time to explore the upper floors. They head up the stairs to the second floor and poke their head out. Everything looks to be about the same as on the first floor. They go back into the stairwell and start heading up again. It feels like they've been walking up the stairs for a long time though. They should be all the way at the roof by now. They finally reach a door. It must lead to a taller part of the building they couldn't see from the ground outside. They open the door and see… the second floor again. How could this be? The two look at each other. They have explored a lot of strange abandoned places, but nothing has creeped them out like this before. They head back down the stairs, and after only a few steps, they are back on the first floor. 
Something is really wrong with this place. Maybe it's best if they leave. They start walking back towards the entrance, but one grabs the other and points into a classroom. Isn't this the room they went in before? It has to be. The same apple is on the desk, but the complicated physics lesson has been erased. Now the chalkboard has just a simple phrase written on it. The children used to sing. The two scream and run out of the classroom, but which way is the entrance? The hall appears to stretch on in either direction before turning at 90 degree angles. This isn't right. The entrance was definitely visible from outside the classroom before. They pick a direction and start to run. The hallways seem to go on and on, turning in ways that should double back on themselves, but they still can't find the entrance. They try going back up through a stairwell, but just like before, there appears to be either too many or not enough stairs between the floors. The explorers keep running, checking rooms for a way out. Somehow they keep finding that same room with the rotten apple on the desk. They're panicking now. Every time they look away, the graffiti on the wall changes, or a new classroom door appears in the hall. They keep running, though, turning corner after corner after corner until… there it is, the entrance. But it's then that one of the explorers realizes he is all alone. He must have outran his friend. He looks at the entrance. It's so close. He starts to step towards it, but no. He can't leave his friend. He'll find him. He turns around and right in front of him is the same classroom again. The one with the apple. Only this time, his friend is in there, sitting in a desk in the middle of the room, asleep. Gathering the last of his courage, he runs into the room and tries to wake his friend, but he won't come out of his deep sleep. He pulls him out of the desk. If he won't walk out, he'll drag him out. He pulls him out of the classroom and down the hall towards the entrance. They're almost home free. He's just feet away from the door. He reaches out with his free hand and grabs the handle. Locked. He starts banging on the door, terrified that they'll be trapped in this place forever. When suddenly, the doors swing open. Two stern-looking men in suits are standing in front of him. You aren't supposed to be here, one of the men says, as the other picks up his friend, throws him over his shoulder, and escorts the both of them out of the school. What these urban explorers didn't know is that they had just unintentionally entered a mysterious anomaly that the SCP Foundation has designated SCP-026, a strange location that has been given the nickname After School Retention. SCP-026 is a three-story building that used to be a public school prior to it being shut down and condemned after both staff and students reported various anomalous properties in the building. They described hallways that seemed to change in length, classrooms disappearing and reappearing, and stairways with different numbers of steps leading up and down. The discrepancies between the building's blueprints and the reported interior were strange enough, but the former school truly came onto the Foundation's radar after the disappearances of multiple people in the area were linked to the location. It was initially believed, after sending in robots equipped with video equipment to explore the school, that the spatial anomalies were actually caused by an anomalous mental effect the space was having on people's perception, and that the physical layout of the school was not actually changing. However, additional exploration has proven that this is not the case. The physical space of the school does in fact seem to change, and even the exploration robots are affected by this shifting geometry. The inside of the school is covered in a substantial amount of graffiti, and most of it is the type you'd expect to see in any abandoned space gang signs, names, and street art, for example. But it appears to fade in and out and will change location. The writing on the chalkboards in the classroom appears to do the same, and just like the graffiti, much of what is written on the chalkboards is what you would expect to find in a school. Most of the writing relates to basic subjects like math, literature, and biology. However, some of the subjects that have appeared are highly advanced and out of place in a non-university setting such as the notes on quantum entanglement that were found on a chalkboard. Bizarrely, the phrase, the children used to sing, has been found multiple times in a variety of places around the building, though researchers are still left without an answer as to what it means or what significance it holds. But the anomalous nature of the writing inside of SCP-026 doesn't stop there. The written content of books, notepads, and other pieces of paper brought into the school have been observed to disappear leaving blank pages behind, only for the writing to reappear as graffiti or on the chalkboards. It is unknown why or how this is happening, but those working within SCP-026 are advised to be careful of what written materials they bring inside. Multiple unconscious persons have also been found in the building, 
Several of the people found in the school have been identified as either former students or faculty of the school, including teachers and janitors, all of whom had been reported missing in the years following the school's closure. Despite some of them disappearing as long as 10 years after the school closed, when they are found inside SCP-026, they appear much younger than they should be, with the majority being high school aged and dressed in the style of the school's dress code in the time before it was shut down. It is currently not known how they ended up inside of SCP-026 or why they present as being a younger version of themselves. Attempts to wake unconscious people while still inside the school are always unsuccessful. However, once they are transported outside of SCP-026, they will immediately awaken. All have displayed signs of confusion in their brief moments of consciousness before quickly dying from what appears to be severe dehydration. Their bodies will then experience rapid advanced decomposition. No useful information on the nature of SCP-026 has been gleaned from any of these subjects in the brief period after removing them from the school that they are conscious and alive. There have also been several cases of D-Class personnel who had participated in SCP-026 research disappearing from Foundation control, only to be found within the school at a later date. All are found sleeping and experience the same fate as the others who mysteriously appear within the school. The same inability to wake up while inside the school appears to also apply to those who enter SCP-026 and fall asleep, though they do not suffer the same gruesome fate upon being removed from the site and waking. Such was the case for a Foundation agent who, during a routine security check of the site, was found sleeping in the entranceway of the school by his partner. They were unable to wake the agent up, and he was moved outside the building. As soon as he was outside of SCP-026, the agent regained consciousness and appeared to be in a state of extreme agitation. In later interviews, he reported that he had dreamed he was in a strange classroom, and the same dream has been reported by all subjects who have fallen asleep in the school, as well as by the D-Class personnel who were later found inside. They all describe that in the dream, they are sitting inside of a classroom that closely resembles those found in SCP-026, though in the dream it is in a condition that matches how it likely appeared while it was still a functioning school. The bell rings, but no one moves, and raising their hand does not get the teacher's attention. Everyone is just sitting silently. If they try to leave the classroom, they find the doors locked. They then notice what is really off about the dream. Everything is in black and white, except for the dreamer, who looks down at their own hands and realizes that they are in color. Just as they begin to realize that they are dreaming, and that they are the one who is out of place, they wake up. This dream will persist recurring over and over, and each time it takes the dreamer longer and longer to realize that they are dreaming. They also notice each time that their hands are a little more gray. Research into SCP-026 is ongoing, and all potential entrances, including both doors and windows, are to remain locked and boarded up in between investigative missions. Alarms have been placed around the location to alert Foundation personnel in the event that civilians or any other unauthorized personnel gain entry to the site. Due to the fact that even with these precautions, people continue to be found within SCP-026, and there has not yet been a reliable way discovered to prevent it, this anomaly has been classified as Euclid. While you do not appear to be at risk of any serious danger if you have not previously fallen asleep in SCP-026, pay attention to your dreams. And if at any time you find yourself back in a classroom setting where things seem, well, off, contact the nearest SCP Foundation personnel to receive Class A amnestics in order to minimize any risk of you experiencing an after-school retention. A hand clasps around your throat, cutting off your scream. You try to move, but the hands of the two people restraining you won't allow it. You're being dragged towards something monstrous and terrible in the corner something hiding under a white sheet. You will die a painful death, and the ones dragging you towards it are your parents. As the dewy green of summer begins to fade, the grass drying, the air chilling, and the leaves turning shades of fire and gold, most children's thoughts turn to Halloween. Visions of fun-sized candy bars spilling out of plastic pumpkin buckets, of ill-fitting rubber masks that smell like the back of a party store, of candy apples and ringing doorbells, and terrifying their friends with scary stories. It's a magical time where anyone can be anything, and candy is free to anyone who asks the question, trick or treat. But as those children get older, Halloween begins to lose its magic. 
They age out of trick-or-treating and no longer find themselves amused by carving pumpkins or screaming at plastic skeletons in their neighbor's yards. They age out of the sense of wonder and they find that their neighbors aren't as keen to give away candy to someone with a driver's license. But some children hold on to that love of Halloween into adulthood, transforming the childlike joy into an appreciation for parties, more mature scary stories with blood and guts aplenty, and yes, themed baked goods. You're never too old to enjoy a Rice Krispie treat shaped like a ghost. At least, that's what the sorority girl planning the biggest Halloween party on campus at her small university believes. She has festooned the sorority house with fake cobwebs and ghosts made of hanging bits of gauze, with plastic spiders and zombies made of rubber. There are the classic plastic skeletons, the jack-o'-lanterns filled with battery-powered candles, no fire hazards here, and of course, a huge cauldron filled with punch and dry ice. Smoke billows over the sides of the cauldron as she stirs the garish but inviting lime green liquid inside. She has the lights rigged up to give the place an eerie red glow and has the perfect playlist of Halloween music put together. Now she just needs to wait for the guests to arrive. At first, she worries that no one will come. The first few people to ring the doorbell turn out to be trick-or-treaters, and she sends them away with a fistful of candy bars and a smile. But each time, she is secretly a little disappointed. About an hour after she finished setting up, guests begin to arrive. Even if not everyone at school is into Halloween, there are very few college students who will pass up an opportunity for a party. And before long, the house is filled with dancing pirates, vampires sipping cups of punch, werewolves digging into bowls of chips, and cats flirting with dogs. Everyone is dressed up and embracing the Halloween spirit, and the girl couldn't be happier. She's been so busy playing hostess that she almost forgot to dress up, but she takes a moment to steal away upstairs and put on her costume. A classic witch costume, black dress, black shoes, and complete with a pointy black hat. As she heads back downstairs, dressed up and ready to have a great time, she takes a moment to survey the crowd. It seems like everyone on campus decided to come to her party. The girl is going to get herself a drink and settle in to enjoy her party when she hears the doorbell ring. Someone else is here. But as she walks toward the door, she pauses for a moment, an icy chill of dread washing over her. The party guests know that they can just walk right in. That's what they've been doing all night. And it's almost midnight, much too late for trick-or-treaters. Who's out there? She peers through the peephole and sees someone in a rudimentary ghost costume, covered head to toe in a white sheet. Even if it's someone she knows, she wouldn't be able to recognize them like that. She can't explain why, but she has a bad feeling about this person. She doesn't want to be rude, but she wants to let them in even less. She turns back away from the door, ready to let the stranger stand on her porch all night, and finds all of her party guests standing still, staring at the door staring at her. She tries to laugh it off and get everyone to return to the party, but the energy in the room has shifted. Everyone's focus is on the person on the other side of the door. She walks to the punch bowl, pours herself a cup, and encourages everyone to get back to the party. Instead, a pirate and a mermaid walk to the door, turning the knob even as the girl asks them to stop. They open it, letting the stranger in the sheet inside. The figure glides through the door, moving in a way that seems just a little bit off. The girl is struck with a feeling that she hasn't experienced since she was a little girl, the sense, deep down in her gut, that something could really be a monster. Whatever she does, she can't let the thing in the sheet get close to her. She doesn't know what will happen, but the thought of it turns her stomach with a primal sense of danger. She starts to run, but a girl dressed as a tiger grabs hold of her arm, wrenching her back. The girl struggles to free herself, but a man in a vampire costume grabs her other arm, gripping her so tight his knuckles turn white and she can feel the flesh bruising. She pleads with her friends, trying to get them to see reason and release her, but they won't budge. The tiger girl apologizes through tears, but won't let go. As the girl thrashes, pulling so hard to free herself that she worries her arm will break, the figure in the sheet inches closer and closer. She shouts at it, demanding to know who it is, what it wants, why it's hiding behind that sheet. But it doesn't say a word doesn't give a clue. There's no expression to read, only the blank white fabric. When it reaches the girl, her feet fly out from under her, and she collapses to the ground, yanked forward by an unseen force. Something is pulling her under the sheet. She claws at the floor, trying to drag herself away from the force, but she can't. The party guests watch, helpless, as their hostess disappears under the sheet, until the only thing left is her writhing silhouette and her screams. 
Then, the screams go quiet. Nothing left of the girl but her witch's hat lying on the floor. The figure gathers its sheet around itself and calmly walks out of the party. Those unfortunate guests watch their even more unfortunate friend encounter the creature known as SCP-6096. SCP-6096 is a humanoid entity that spends all of its time hidden beneath a large cotton sheet. A vague sense of its shape can be garnered by observing the entity, but its body is hidden at all times, preventing a complete physical description from being recorded. However, Foundation researchers have determined via a cursory examination that the entity is 1.55 meters tall and that it weighs approximately 48 kilograms. The sheet itself is larger than SCP-6096's body, trailing on the ground behind it by at least a meter whenever the entity moves. All attempts to remove the sheet in order to get a proper look at the thing have been unsuccessful. One of the most unusual properties of SCP-6096 is that it cannot be harmed. I don't mean that it is impervious to damage, but rather that any living being that attempts to engage in a behavior that would harm the entity finds themselves unable to do so. This includes, but is presumably not limited to, actions such as attempting to attack SCP-6096, attempting to order others to attack SCP-6096, attempting to trick others into attacking SCP-6096 without their knowledge, laying a trap for SCP-6096, ordering others to lay a trap for SCP-6096, creating an autonomous device that would harm SCP-6096, attempting to leave SCP-6096 unsupervised and in harm's way, and attempting to remove SCP-6096's sheet. Most of the time, SCP-6096's behavior is described as peaceful and docile. As long as there is no danger present, it allows itself to be led into containment and remains there with seemingly no objections. However, every so often, the entity becomes active and will attempt to leave its location. It does so at a steady pace with single-minded persistence as it pursues one specific target at a time. It is uncertain how the entity chooses a target, but so far, it has always been a seemingly random human being somewhere on Earth. Not only does SCP-6096 know exactly who its target is, but anyone who observes the entity during an active period finds that they, too, know who it is seeking out. In addition to this anomalous effect, the person will also find themselves compelled to help SCP-6096 reach its intended target. These targets appear to be the only individuals unaffected by SCP-6096's anti-harm properties. A person that the entity has selected will, in fact, be able to harm it. However, none have managed to successfully do so, mainly due to the protective influence of the other humans caught in the creature's anomalous thrall. But what happens when SCP-6096 reaches its target? Research into this has been largely inconclusive, but a few facts are certain. SCP-6096 will pull the person underneath its sheet until they have disappeared from view. If the victim is conscious, they can be heard fighting, struggling, and screaming in unimaginable agony for up to 40 minutes. Then they go silent and are never seen again. Once its chosen victim has disappeared, SCP-6096 becomes docile and largely immobile again and can be led back to containment. Whatever happens to its targets under that sheet, it is definitely not anything good. SCP-6096 was discovered by the SCP Foundation on September 12, 2018, when police were called to the home of the Malian family in the town of Durham, New Mexico. Samuel and Amanda Malian greeted the officers in a state of distress, claiming that a person wearing a sheet had come into their home and somehow caused their 16-year-old son Desmond to disappear. Authorities spotted SCP-6096 inside the home and planned to remove the sheet in order to interrogate and detain the suspect, but found themselves unable to take another step closer to the thing. Terrified by their inexplicable encounter, they submitted an incident report to their supervisor, who passed it up through the chain of command in the regional government until it landed in the hands of the SCP Foundation. Alongside the police report, the Foundation was able to access security camera footage from the Malian family home. A transcription of the video's contents is included in the official Foundation files. I'll do my best to summarize its events. The home security footage depicts the Malian family sitting on their living room couch, facing the television. Samuel and Amanda watch a program on TV as Desmond idly scrolls through his phone. Outside, a car can be heard pulling into the driveway. Though the driver's identity has not been confirmed, this is believed to be a local taxi driver named Drake Ellen, dropping SCP-6096 off at the Malian's door. A 
A moment later, Samuel draws his wife's attention toward a window. At first, the two are surprised but amused, assuming that SCP-6096 is some sort of errant Halloween decoration. However, they become increasingly disturbed as the sheet-covered figure approaches their door and begins to knock, so softly it is nearly inaudible. As Samuel gets up to enter the door, Amanda grabs her son's arm, holding him in an increasingly tight grip and refusing to let him pull away. Unable to stop herself, no matter how upset she becomes, she holds Desmond still as her husband lets SCP-6096 into the house. It glides across the floor toward Desmond, who struggles to break free from his crying mother's grasp. Amanda can be heard reassuring him, saying, You just stay still, honey. You just close your eyes. It won't hurt if you just close your eyes. I love you. Desmond struggles harder, but finds himself unable to break his mother's hold. He kicks his legs, knocking his phone to the ground as the sheet-covered entity draws closer and closer. He begs his mother to let him go, but she doesn't budge. His father, through tears, says, Just stay still, son. Just stay still. It won't hurt for long. It can't hurt for long. Stay strong. Stay strong for me. Starting with his feet, the entity begins to cover Desmond with its sheet, pulling him out of sight. Amanda and Samuel watch in wordless, open-mouthed horror, silent screams stretching their faces into masks of terror and grief. Desmond can be heard screaming, thrashing violently beneath the sheet, though what exactly is happening to him under there cannot be seen. This continues for the next 36 minutes, until Desmond has completely vanished. At this point, SCP-6096 wraps itself in its sheet and sits down on the floor, watching the television without a care in the world. Amanda and Samuel, on the other hand, find themselves able to move on their own again, and must reckon with what they just saw, what they just participated in. Samuel collapses to the ground, curling up in the fetal position and rocking back and forth in shock. Amanda stumbles backward, keeping her eyes locked on SCP-6096, and dials 911 on her cell phone. They stay right there until the police arrive. At this point, the video log cuts out. After the SCP Foundation was notified of the incident at the Malian family home, Foundation officers administered Class A amnestics to Amanda and Samuel, as well as to all responding officers who encountered SCP-6096. It is uncertain how long SCP-6096 was operating before this incident, or where it could have come from. SCP-6096's containment is strictly under the jurisdiction of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers. The anomaly is kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber, located on the grounds of Site-19, where it is monitored by on-site personnel via video and audio recording devices. If any changes in its behavior are noted, they are to be promptly logged and reported. Unlike most anomalies at the SCP Foundation, SCP-6096 is permitted to leave its containment area whenever it chooses. Whenever it does choose to leave, SCP-6096 must be escorted to its intended destination by MTF Zeta-29. Task Force members may use whatever method of transportation is most convenient at the time. While this group is escorting the entity, a secondary team will travel to its intended target, dosing them with a high-grade tranquilizer to render them unconscious. Once the entity has disposed of its target, it will be accompanied back to its containment chamber. There are no easy jobs at the SCP Foundation, aside from the lucky few who get to spend their days playing with SCP-999. But staff assigned to the containment, if you can even call it that, of SCP-6096 report some of the lowest morale levels at the organization. A welcome notice from Charlie Simansky, commander of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers, is included in the official file, presumably for task force member eyes only. Nevertheless, I feel it is important that I share the contents of this note with all of you, as they provide a valuable look into the perspective of the members of this unfortunate task force. It reads, And there you have it. Welcome to Mobile Task Force Zeta-29. No need to worry about professionalism down here. The higher-ups couldn't demote me if they wanted to. Apparently my presence as the head of SCP-6096 containment is beneficial enough to it that me being reassigned would count as harming it. Lucky me. You're probably wondering how we can be shameless enough to say we have this thing under containment. It comes and goes whenever it feels like it, and if it ever decided it didn't want to come back to its containment cell, we have literally no way of forcing it. And yeah, you're probably also thinking that calling that room a containment chamber instead of a hotel room is just as shameful. To that I say, you're absolutely right. There's nothing we can do against SCP-6096. Feel free to self-medicate until you're able to accept that. Don't hold back. 
you're going to become very familiar with that feeling of gnawing guilt. I know I did, the first time I had to hold the door to a maternity ward open for this thing. The idea of containing SCP-6096 is a bad joke. We all decided a long time ago that the only way out of this nightmare is liquidation, decommissioning, neutralization, whatever you want to call it. But that's no walk in the park either. I've stood in that chamber for hours, gun pointed at 6096's head, screaming at my finger just to tighten slightly. Didn't work. You can't harm SCP-6096, no matter how much you want to. You can't even try to start a Rube Goldberg kind of thing to eventually harm SCP-6096. It's just a fact of the world, maybe a semiohazard or whatever it's called. The way I see it then, there are three main ways out of this nightmare. One, another organization, maybe the GOC, takes a shot at it without realizing what they're dealing with. Maybe they think we're transporting something much more dangerous. Maybe they think we're in over our heads with it, and they take it out with a drone or something, blow the thing to hell while we're transporting it. A bomb would kill it easy, I think. It feels weak. This would only work so long as the GOC thinks they're bombing something else entirely. If they knew it was SCP-6096, they'd just be contained too. 2. An AIC deals with it. I don't know if an artificial intelligence is immune to SCP-6096's effects, but the fact that it won't let me tell one of them about it gives me hope. Maybe one day one of those computers gets a mission, and maybe that mission, by complete coincidence, happens to lead them over to this file. Then they use their superior intelligence to set things up so 6096 runs into an accident out of the blue. 3. A target gets lucky. Maybe 6096 goes after a gun nut, and the poor guy gets a lucky shot in before we can hold him down. This almost happened once, but Lopez took the bullet. Poor guy bled out while we were holding the target down for 6096. Maybe it'll happen again? Go better? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Let's be honest. These scenarios aren't scenarios, they're fantasies. The odds of any of these things happening on their own are tiny, minuscule. The only thing that can really do 6096 in, far as I can see, is sheer coincidence. All we can do is wait and hope. Hope for one of us to make a genuine mistake that gets the right dominoes falling. But I wouldn't hold your breath. After all, we're so good at what we do. Of all the anomalies I have studied, SCP-6096 is one that troubles me more than almost any other. I have lost sleep watching the Malian family security footage again and again, each time shocked by the sight of two tearful parents helping a sheet-covered stranger steal their only son, doing who knows what to him in the process. No matter how hard I try, I cannot discern SCP-6096's motives, its origins, or even what its real face looks like. Perhaps it doesn't have one. Perhaps there's nothing under that sheet. The hardest part is knowing that I will likely never know. That uncertainty is so much worse than any of the horrible truths I have uncovered in my years of studying the anomalies that hide in the shadows of our world. Though I may never uncover the answers to the mystery of SCP-6096, there is one thing I know for certain. I will never be able to relax around Halloween. That walking bedsheet might be someone who ran out of time to plan a proper costume and just grab the first thing they could find. Or, it could be a faceless horror walking with the relaxed gait of the incomprehensibly powerful on its way to claim another unfortunate soul. The boy and his father have spent the entire morning cleaning out the basement of the boy's grandfather, and the boy is absolutely exhausted. After yet another trip up those rickety cellar steps, the boy collapses onto the old living room couch. He can still hear his father puttering around downstairs, yelping and gasping in surprise every time he finds some memento of his childhood stashed among the debris. The boy sighs in annoyance. He doesn't really know his grandfather, so he doesn't feel any sense of loss as they tear through the boxes and bags in the basement. His father, however, insisted that the boy come along. It'll be good for us to spend some time together, he said, and the boy suspects that his father is trying to deal with his own guilt about his strained relationship with the boy's grandfather. Perhaps he hopes that a day of father-son bonding is just what they need to make sure that they don't grow apart as his father did with his grandfather. The boy, however, doesn't think that cleaning out a musty old basement should qualify as effective father-son bonding. It's super boring. Worse, it turns out that the boy's deceased grandfather was an absolute hoarder who couldn't throw anything away, so the house is filled with all sorts of worthless garbage. The boy groans, his feet ache from traipsing all those stairs, and his back aches from carrying boxes. He thinks that he deserves a little break. He pulls a small handheld gaming console from the pocket of his hoodie and turns it on. I'll just play for a couple minutes, he thinks to himself, then I'll go and help Dad some more. 
you won't mind if I take a short break to recover. The boy is sitting on the battered couch in the living room, playing the latest game on his handheld game console, when his father lurches into the room, carrying a gigantic white plastic box in his arms. Check it out, sport, says his dad, a wide grin on his face. Look what I just found in the basement. The boy briefly looks up from his game, resisting the temptation to roll his eyes at his father's annoying enthusiasm. His father is always getting excited for the dumbest things. As for that white box, the boy's never seen anything like it. It's a Sega Dreamcast, the father says as he sets the white box on the living room floor and starts to untangle the massive wires protruding from the back of the object. This was my favorite video game system when I was a kid. I guess your grandfather just couldn't throw it away. What else is new? mutters the boy under his breath, but he bites his tongue as he watches his father studiously pick apart the knots in the tangled wires. Obviously, this hunk of junk has big sentimental value for his dad. Reluctantly, he slides off the couch and takes a seat next to his father on the floor, and together, the two of them set up the Dreamcast. This had all the best games, continues his father. Soul Calibur, Sega vs. Capcom, oh, you're gonna love these. After a few minutes, his father has the wires plugged into the television, and the hand controller's ready. He nudges his son in the side with his elbow. What do you say, champ? You ready to go mano a mano against your old man with some real video games? I'm about to school you in what real games are like, none of this silly, what's it called, Among Us junk like you played today. It's not called Among Us, Dad, mutters the boy under his breath, but his father is already distracted pulling out old games. His father holds up a CD clamshell and pries it open, revealing a stack of silvery discs. And look at this, all my old games too. The boy tries to contain his boredom as his father rattles off a list of his favorite old video games, none of which are familiar to the boy. But eventually, his father reaches one disc that isn't familiar. Eurythmics, he says, squinting at the title embossed across the disc. I don't remember this one. I wonder if your grandfather got it after I moved out. The father pauses as if overcome with emotion. The boy can imagine what his father is thinking. Did his grandfather buy this disc knowing how much his father loved his Dreamcast video games and hoping that maybe it could serve as a reconciliation present between them? That's exactly the sort of dopey sentimental thing that his dad would think after spending all morning going through his grandfather's junk and reminiscing about what could have been. Uh, it looks like it's some sort of dance game, prompts the boy, hoping to get his father to focus more on the game than his feelings of nostalgia and loss. Oh, right, right, says the father. I wonder why grandpa had this when he didn't have a dance mat to connect. Maybe you just have to hit the control buttons in rhythm? Hmm. He holds it up, the reflective disc shining brightly in the light of the overhead lamp, and the boy stares at the silvery disc in confusion. He's seen pictures of CD-ROM discs before, in old catalogs or even movies, but he's never seen one in real life. Who even uses discs like that anymore? Everything's just downloadable from the internet these days. What is that anyway? asks the boy. A CD? This is not a CD, says his father, a slight edge of annoyance in his voice. The boy rolls his eyes. His father is always acting like he should be familiar with the outdated dinosaur technology of his father's youth. When will his dad learn? Just because this junk was important to his father when he was growing up doesn't mean that it's still important to the next generation. The boy holds his tongue, knowing that his father will probably start to sulk if he's reminded that time marches on, and that he's no longer as hip and with it as he likes to think he is. It's a GD-ROM says his father, as if those words are supposed to mean anything to the boy. It stands for Gigabyte Disk Read-Only Memory. The boy has no clue what that means, and he hopes that his father isn't about to start a lecture on the different kinds of obsolete video game tech that he's suddenly decided are so vitally important for his son to know about. Luckily, his dad doesn't launch into a long-winded talk. He's too curious about what's on this mysterious disk to bother about that now. The father shoves the disk into the Dreamcast and settles down on the floor, gripping the controller with both hands. He's as excited as a kid in a candy store as he waits for the screen to boot up. The boy can't remember the last time that his father has been so eager for anything. But his excitement is short-lived as the first loading screen boots up. A cheerful, happy melody plays from the Dreamcast speakers. The game title, Eurythmics, flashes on screen with options for one or two players listed below it. The father clicks over to two players, nodding for his son to pick up the other controller. The boy does as he's told. He can't imagine that this game is going to be any good. How old is it anyway? It's from when his dad was a kid, so that's all the way back in the 90s. This game might as well be a hundred years old for all the boy cares. Immediately when the father chooses two players, the screen starts to glitch. The father yells in frustration, throwing his controller to the floor, but the boy sighs in relief. Thank God, at least now he won't have to pretend that this dinosaur game is anything good. I guess it's busted, says the boy, ready to turn away from the Dreamcast.
but his father is insistent. No, no, it's just warming up. Watch, I'll fix this. He grabs his controller and tries to click on two players again. The screen only glitches more. Okay, okay, just give me a minute, says the father. If this doesn't work, I'll just take the disc out and blow on it. I'm sure that'll work. The boy stares in confusion. It's a disc, not a cartridge. He doesn't see any way that blowing on it will have any effect. His father is just desperately grasping at straws, upset that his attempt at father-son bonding is being thwarted. Meanwhile, the cheerful loading screen music starts to fray, stuck repeating a single reverberating note that gradually degenerates into a tuneless cacophony. The pixels shimmy and wobble on screen, the image fracturing worse and worse as the father struggles to get the game console to respond to his commands. The boy watches the screen with disinterest at first, but then… wait, what's going on? The more he stares at the screen, the more the random noises and broken graphics seem to form into something strange, something unknowable but also something vaguely coherent? He blinks in confusion, his jaw dropping. He wants to call his father's attention to the bizarre formations on screen, but his father is too busy wrestling with the controller to notice the effect that he's having. Dad, Dad, look at the screen, says the boy, grabbing his father's shoulder and pointing. Huh, what is it, did it work? What the? The father furrows his brow in confusion as he notices the wildly oscillating image on the TV screen for the first time. That doesn't look like a Dreamcast game at all. It's all broken, I... I think? The colors swirl around the screen in hypnotic, psychedelic patterns, and both father and son find themselves mesmerized, unable to look away. The boy is only vaguely aware of what computer graphics in the late 90s would have looked like, but he's reasonably sure that no underpowered 90s console could produce something this wild. The boy feels himself getting groggy, his brain fogging over as he stares at the wildly oscillating shapes on the screen. He feels like he could almost make sense of them if he just tried hard enough. It's like looking at one of those old-fashioned magic eye pictures, where the image only collapses into sense if you cross your eyes just right, but these strange swirls of color are something far beyond that. The swirls spiral into distinct vortex patterns, to the point that the boy might almost believe that he's looking at… eyes. Yes, that's it, he's sure of it. He wants to panic as he becomes aware of the sensation of being watched. He feels like something beyond the screen, some malevolent entity, has somehow gained access to his world via this video game and is now watching him, sizing him up like a predator would size up its prey. He can't think of anything except those staring eyes with their rotating pupils. He wants to fall forward and disappear into the eternal nothingness of those awful eyes. Next to him, his father is silent. Like the boy, he's also enraptured by the infinite eyes on screen. Oh my god, he mutters, so quiet that the boy can barely hear him. Do you… do you see the eyes? It's your grandfather. He's watching us. From… beyond. I know that's him. The boy doesn't know whether his father is right. His father is probably just letting his guilt color his perception because the boy doesn't feel like there's human intelligence on the other side of the screen. Whatever is out there, whether it's an alien mind from beyond human ken, or simply a computer program given awful sentience by a freak accident, it's not something that the boy can even begin to comprehend. He feels his mind shutting down in the face of that terror, as if his brain simply cannot take the strain anymore. He's only vaguely aware of his father hitting the floor in a dead faint. That should worry him. He should be frightened. He should want to rush to his father's side and try to shake him back awake, but his brain can't make his body respond. He feels his arms and legs getting weak and his eyelids getting heavy. It isn't long before his eyes drift shut and the boy collapses onto the floor next to his father. Hours later, after the sun has already set, a car pulls up in front of the house and the boy's mother gets out. She frowns as she looks at the front of the house, noting that the lights are on inside, and the front bay window casts a yellow square of light across the front lawn. The boy and his father must still be inside. They were supposed to have finished moving all that junk hours ago. She's tried calling both of their cell phones to remind them that they should be home for dinner, but neither father nor son has answered any of her calls or texts. She's not worried, though. They often ignore their phones when they get really involved in an activity, and she suspects, rightly, that her husband probably found some childhood relic in the basement that's distracted him from getting the task done. She's willing to bet that the two of them probably haven't even finished cleaning the basement. She walks up the garden path and puts her hand against the doorknob. The door creaks open. She frowns. Nothing sinister about that, right? 
Of course, they wouldn't bother to lock the door if they were still working inside, right? Nevertheless, she feels a strange chill run up her spine. Why is she suddenly so nervous? She pushes open the door and fumbles for the light switch. The foyer is dark, as is most of the house. The only light comes from the living room, and she can see that something within is throwing dancing shadows against the far wall. She hears a toneless, mechanical drone emanating from the living room. Are they watching television? That would be just like them to turn on the tube and completely lose track of time. But what TV show would make an awful din like that? She storms into the living room, ready to read her husband and son the riot act. But then, she stops dead in her tracks. Her husband and son are here all right, but they're lying in crumpled heaps upon the floor, staring glassy-eyed at the ceiling. She screams as she rushes to her husband, praying that she's wrong, that they're just playing a prank on her, that they just got tired and lay down on the floor to rest. But as she presses her finger against his wrist, she feels that he's cold and lifeless. He's dead, and has been for hours. Her son, pale and cold and lifeless, lies next to him. She looks up, her gaze connecting with the television screen. It continues to flash vacillating images in an erratic loop, nonsense static that she can't understand. But if she didn't know better, she might almost feel like it's watching her. The strange, swirling eyes stare back, unblinking and eternal. What started as a misguided attempt at father-son bonding time ended in tragedy, because those GD-ROM discs weren't ordinary discs at all, but rather instances of what the SCP Foundation has dubbed SCP-4904. SCP-4904 is a set of seven modified GD-ROM discs manufactured by the Sega Corporation. SCP Foundation agents have been able to pinpoint the date of manufacture of each disc sometime between 1997 and 1999. The GD-ROM was a proprietary format originally used for the Dreamcast video game console, developed by Yamaha as an answer to fighting the piracy that was rampant among more standard compact discs, and to offer increased storage capacity without the expense of the fledgling DVD-ROM. The GD-ROM seemed promising at the time, as it had a storage capacity of a full gigabyte, 42% higher than conventional CDs. Ultimately though, GD-ROMs failed to catch on and were quickly outpaced by DVD technology. The seven discs in the SCP Foundation storage are visually indistinguishable from non-anomalous GD-ROM discs, except for their serial numbers. The serial numbers give some indication of the mystery behind their origin, revealing that they were created by Sega's enigmatic R&D Zero division during the height of the 90s console wars. It is estimated that R&D Zero produced a total of between 60 and 100 experimental GD-ROM discs similar to those in SCP-4904, but the rest of the production line is currently unaccounted for. Each SCP-4904 GD-ROM contains one Sega video game, including Sonic Adventure, Sega Rally Championship 2, House of the Dead 2, Sega Bass Fishing, Godzilla Generations, Virtua Fighter 3 TB, and an unreleased 3D rhythm game by the name of Eurythmics. But the result when anyone tries to play any of these different games is always the same. When an instance of SCP-4904 is fed into a Dreamcast console, it causes the optical disk drive's reader to move in unpredictable ways, accessing disk data seemingly at random. At first, the game boots up as expected and seems perfectly ordinary, but when a player progresses past the loading screen, the game very quickly becomes illegible. Sprites and assets blend into each other in asymmetrical chunks, maps recursively render onto other maps, and soundtracks transform within seconds into incessant, oscillating noise. A perfunctory glance at the results seems like absolute chaos, but eventually, observers will start to notice patterns within the noise. These eventually coalesce into complex renderings of landscapes and figures wildly inconsistent with the content of the original games, and computationally impossible for 1990s-era video game hardware to render. Repeated tests by SCP Foundation agents have turned up a recurring motif in the images shown by SCP-4904, spinning disks that resemble malevolent eyes. SCP agents hope that research into R&D Zero and the man responsible for the disk's creation might help to explain the reason or the purpose of SCP-4904. R&D Zero's former lead hardware programmer Ken Matsuya has said on record that the team encountered numerous problems in implementing the disk's anti-piracy encryption measures. The result was unplayable. Frustrated by this failure, Sega ordered that the encryption project be abandoned and the prototype disks quietly destroyed. However, it does not appear that Sega's orders were carried out to the letter. Matsuya himself rescued seven of the disks, hoping to learn more about the issue on his own time, and it's possible that other disks not currently known to the Foundation also survived. 
With the help of improvised Sega hardware, Matsuya spent the next four years trying to understand the cause behind the disc's erratic behavior. Notebooks recovered from his apartment contain numerous sketches of the disc-generated visuals. Depicting fractal combinations of landscape and figures seemingly drawn from places outside of the game data themselves, and stylized spinning discs in the shape of eyes. Matsuya himself met a strange and untimely end when he was found dead from a heart attack in his apartment in August 2003. Stranger still, an autopsy revealed that large portions of his brainstem and limbic system were missing. His death puzzled authorities since there was no evidence of any human, or even non-human, intrusion. Matsuya had apparently loaded one of the SCP-4904 instances in his possession into his home Dreamcast before his death, because the distinctive psychedelic visuals were playing on his television screen at the time that his body was discovered. Foundation agents suspected that the visuals might have some connection with Matsuya's death, leading to the disc's subsequent classification and containment, but intensive tests on SCP-4904 by Foundation personnel have failed to shed any light on the situation. Both the disc's strange behavior and Matsuya's death remain complete mysteries. Is SCP-4904 a gateway into some other dimension, and its bizarre images a signal from another world? Could it be a message from beyond the veil? Or is it all just due to a simple computer glitch and Matsuya's death just a freak coincidence? Whatever the case, the Foundation is doing its best to uncover the truth. SCP-4904 has been given the object class safe, but should be stored in conditions comparable to those needed to keep non-anomalous disks viable. All seven instances of SCP-4904 are kept in a climate-controlled safe class storage locker at Site-15. Long-term tests lasting over an hour should only be conducted on reinforced, modified hardware to prevent disk deformation or explosion. The house is small, but cozy. When the realtor showed it to her, she couldn't help but notice all the flaws the chipped paint on the door frame, the missing shingles on the roof, the cracks along the kitchen walls, even the dented old mailbox out front. But even with all those imperfections, she can't help but feel this little house is calling to her. It's where she's meant to be. This will be a home for her. The woman knows, deep in her heart, that this is what she needs to start over. It's not easy. As she moves her things into the new house, she can't help but think about her failed relationship. Every piece of furniture, every knick-knack, reminds her of her old girlfriend. She unloads a heavy box from the back of her car, but she trips over the curb as she turns toward the house. She falls, and the contents of the box spill all over the sidewalk. They're old photo albums. She quickly shoves them back into the box, doing her best to avoid looking at them. But one photo, an old vacation snapshot of her and her girlfriend visiting Niagara Falls, catches her eye as it falls out of an album. She bites her lip and wills herself not to tear up as she pushes it back into the box. How can two people who were once so close grow so far apart? The rest of the day passes in a haze. There's lots to do, what with arranging the furniture and calling up all the utilities. By the end of the day, she's exhausted and thankful to fall into bed. As she gradually drifts off to sleep, she muses on her situation. Today was the hardest day, she tells herself. Every day is only going to get easier from here on out. Time heals all wounds. The next day, she rises early. The sun is shining, birds are chirping. As she walks into her new kitchen to brew a pot of coffee, she's overcome with a sudden surge of good feelings. This house has so much potential. She could learn to live here. She could find a new love here. The world is her oyster, and she's ready for anything. Yes, she tells herself, all I needed was a good night's sleep. Now, she feels totally revitalized. A little while later, she hears the mail truck arrive and depart. Looking out the window, she sees that the delivery person has shoved the little aluminum flag into the upright position, indicating that she has mail. She ties her bathrobe around her waist and, still cradling a mug of steaming coffee in her hands, walks to that battered black mailbox at the end of the walkway. That's the first thing that ought to go. She mumbles to herself as she imagines all her plans to redecorate the house. Maybe she'll get one of those fun mailboxes that come in the shape of a wacky animal or a birdhouse. Something different, something eye-catching. Her old girlfriend never let her do anything fun. She pulls open the mailbox and pulls out a stack of envelopes. Still thinking about the possibilities for a new mailbox, she quickly shuffles through the letters, scanning the return addresses with little interest. It's mostly junk mail. That's no surprise, she just moved in so most of her friends don't know her new address yet. 
but there's one letter at the bottom of the pile that has no return address. Huh, that's weird, she says. It's probably just more junk mail. She knows that some advertisers don't leave return addresses as a way to pique a recipient's interest and trick them into reading their sales pitches. Nevertheless, she's intrigued enough to tear it open. To her surprise, inside is a handwritten letter. Hello, says the letter. I couldn't help but notice you today. I'm really excited to see a new face in the neighborhood. I hope you enjoy your stay here. Maybe we could meet later? See ya! The woman blinks in confusion. This must be a welcome letter from one of her new neighbors, but since it's not signed, she really has no way of knowing which one. It's a little odd, but, well, she's sure that the letter writer must have had good intentions. She pushes the red aluminum flag back into its reclining position, folds the mysterious letter under her arm with her other mail, and retreats back into her new house. Imagine her surprise when, the next day, she finds another letter in her mailbox. Hi again, it says. I saw that you read my letter yesterday. I'm so glad. I was afraid that you wouldn't like me, but now I see that we're going to be great friends. Maybe you'd like to get coffee together sometime? XOXO. P.S. I really like you. Okay, now this is getting a little pushy. That first letter was friendly, if a little awkward, but this one almost sounds like someone is trying to solicit her for a date. She's in no mood for that. Even if she wasn't still hurting from her breakup, she didn't know this mysterious letter writer. Where did they get the nerve to ask her out? Angrily, she crumples up the new letter and throws it directly into the trash. She looks across the hedge, peering into the neighbor's yards. In the yard to her left, a middle-aged man pushes a lawnmower across the grass. In the yard to her right, two old women are gossiping at the fence. She feels suddenly exposed as she realizes that the letters could be coming from anyone in the neighborhood. She hopes that maybe if she ignores it, the message will be clear. She quickly scurries back into her house and slams the door shut. The next morning, she finds another message from her secret admirer together with her other mail. The tone of the letter is more desperate, more wheedling. I saw you throw away my letter yesterday, it says. Why did you do that? Don't you like me? I really thought we would make a great couple. Maybe if you gave me a chance, I could make you so much happier than your ex. The woman doesn't read any farther. She throws the letter to the ground. This is going too far. It was bad enough that a stranger was hitting on her. But now, she knows that her secret admirer is a stalker, too. How else would they know that she threw away their previous letter unless they were watching her as she picked up her mail? And, even more disturbing, how could they possibly know that she had troubles with her ex? She stalks over to the house next door and pounds on the door. When the middle-aged man answers, she confronts him with a letter. Did you write this? What's your problem? She demands as she shoves the paper in his face. I don't know what you're trying to do, but I'm not interested. I want you to keep away from me. I don't know what you're talking about, protests the man, holding up his hands in surrender. I, I didn't write anything. The woman doesn't know if she believes him, but she has to admit that the middle-aged man sounds genuinely confused by her accusations. Maybe he's not the culprit. But when she confronts the neighbor living to the other side, she hears a similar story. Are you sending me these letters because they're actually really creepy? I don't like people watching me, says the woman as she confronts her other neighbor. The old woman just shakes her head. Mercy me, I didn't send you a letter. Why would I do that? I could just come over and talk to you. I don't know why you youngsters are always making up stories about weird letters. The young woman wonders about the old woman's final words when she's eating dinner alone in her kitchen later that night. The way that she complained about young people always making up stories about weird letters makes her wonder if this has happened before. Could it be that other young women have lived in this house before her? And were they victims of the same stalker? But who could this stalker be? It's got to be someone close. She can just feel it. At that moment, she looks up from her meal and gasps in surprise. There, right outside her window, is the black mailbox. It's hovering right at the edge of the window, as if it's shyly peeking in, like a bashful caller afraid of being seen. The young woman blinks and rubs her eyes. When she looks again, the mailbox is gone. She rushes to the door and throws it open. The mailbox is right there, standing at the curb at the end of the footpath, just as it's always been. Are her eyes playing tricks on her? Is the stress of her breakup and the mysterious stalker finally getting to her? The next day, she finds another letter. Her stalker is getting even more unhinged, and the messages are becoming downright crazy. The next day, she finds not just one letter in her mailbox, but two. Both messages sound absolutely deranged. 
her stalker, and at this point there's no doubt in her mind that a stalker is responsible for these letters, has resorted to threats. Why don't you like me? You better change your attitude if you know what's good for you. You think you're too good for me? What does your ex have that I don't? Maybe you need a real man to really show you the ropes. She crushes the letters in her hands, her face flushing with a combination of fear and rage. Who does this person think that they are? She can't take this pressure much longer. She's ready to report these letters to the police, but she still has no idea who's stalking her. Or does she? She can't help but think about that strange incident the previous night when she thought that she saw the mailbox standing right outside the window. But that's crazy, isn't it? Her mailbox can't be stalking her, can it? If she tries to tell anyone that her mailbox is sending her threatening messages, everyone is just going to think that she's crazy. But soon, things start to get worse, escalating in ways that force the woman to confront that possibility. That night, she's in her kitchen fixing dinner. She turns from the stove to grab some condiments from the pantry. That's when she sees it. The mailbox. It's not outside this time, it's in the next room. It's standing partially hidden behind the door, again as if it's trying not to be seen. She drops her work and rushes out into the living room, hoping to catch the mailbox in the act. But it's gone. She runs to the window and, once again, sees the mailbox standing at the end of the walkway in the exact same spot that it should be. She's certain that she can't be imagining these things, but at the same time, what other explanation could there be? She barely gets any sleep that night, tossing and turning with unpleasant dreams. Several times she startles awake, sitting bolt upright in bed, half convinced that the sinister mailbox might even be in the same room with her, watching her as she sleeps. The next day, the exhausted woman rises early from restless dreams and sits on the front porch, waiting for the mail truck to arrive. When the familiar U.S. Postal Service vehicle pulls up to the curb, she stalks over and confronts the mailman. Come on, hand it over, she demands. It's my mail, give it to me. She's too flustered by this whole absurd scenario to bother being polite, and the mailman is in no mood to argue. This woman looks positively insane, he thinks. Her hair is disheveled, her eyes are ringed with heavy black circles, and she looks like she hasn't had a decent night's sleep in weeks. He has to deal with all kinds of crazy customers every day, and he knows better than to push his luck. He shoves the bundle of letters into her arms and jumps back into his truck. The woman quickly shuffles through the stack of letters, scanning the return addresses and throwing each envelope to the ground behind her when she's satisfied that it's not from her stalker. Just as she thought, none of these letters match the description of the blank envelopes that her stalker uses for his messages. She pulls open the mailbox and looks inside. To her horror, there's already a letter inside. She grabs it and feels the blood drain from her face as she looks at the blank envelope. It's another message from her stalker. Now she knows that he's sending the letters through the mail, but how did he get this letter into the mailbox without her seeing him? She woke up so early this morning, even before the sun was up, and she's been watching the mailbox for hours. It doesn't make sense that any of her neighbors could have planted this message without her knowing, but the only other possible explanation is that the mailbox itself is somehow writing these letters. She stares at the black aluminum box, the dark dented metal suddenly taking on a sinister aspect in the early morning sunlight. Maybe she really is going insane. Maybe she just misses her ex-girlfriend so much that she's imagining all this madness and just projecting her fear of being alone onto this mailbox. No, no, she doesn't believe that at all. She's going to put a stop to this, once and for all. The woman jogs into her garage and returns several moments later with a shovel. She doesn't know whether she's hallucinating or not, but she's had just about enough of this stupid mailbox. She wants it out of her life. Even if it's not stalking her, even if this is all in her mind, it's clear that there's something off about this mailbox, something that's putting her ill at ease. She starts to shovel dirt away from the base of the mailbox post, grunting and sweating with the exertion of her work, but not stopping until the post is loose. She grabs at the thick wooden post and hoists the mailbox, post and all, out of its pit. She drags it across the lawn to her driveway, where, with considerable effort, she manages to shove it into the back seat of her car, ripping the upholstery of the seats and spilling wet dirt all over the floor. She doesn't care about the damage to her car. She just needs to get rid of this mailbox. A chill runs down her spine at the thought of taking a long car ride with that thing behind her. She doesn't trust it at all, and the idea of turning her back on it. Well, she doesn't know what kind of danger she'll be in. As she climbs into the driver's seat, she adjusts the rearview mirror so that she can keep an eye on the mailbox for the whole trip. To her immense relief, it doesn't move once on the whole car ride, even though her nervous eyes keep flicking to the rearview mirror to assuage her fears. She finally arrives at her destination, the city dump. 
She pulls up to the front gate and honks her horn until the custodian comes out of the guardhouse. She motions for him to remove the mailbox from her back seat, and the panicked expression on her face tells him that he should be quick about it. He's barely pulled the mailbox clear the door when the woman peels away, skidding along the curb and gunning the engine to drive away from the dump and the abandoned mailbox as fast as possible. After a few minutes on the road, she starts to calm down. She breathes a deep sigh of relief, a new sense of calm finally settling over her now that she's removed that awful mailbox from her life. She adjusts the rearview mirror to look at her reflection, wincing at the sight of her haggard eyes and blotchy skin. The stress of the last few days must have been really getting to her, but now she feels like she can finally move on with her life. She manages a tense chuckle at the memory. The whole idea that her mailbox was stalking her seems increasingly absurd the further she drives from the dump, but she can't help but feel much better. But when she turns the corner to arrive at her home street, she sees something that she cannot believe. Her eyes bulge from her head, and her fingers tighten around the steering wheel, her knuckles going white. It can't be. The mailbox is back. The same black aluminum box and wooden post. Of course, after all she's been through, she would recognize it anywhere. It's still there, in her front yard, at the end of the walkway. But she's certain that she just dropped it off the dump, right? There's no way that she could have imagined digging up the mailbox and lugging it all the way to the junkyard. Could it be possible that the mailbox somehow followed her home? Could it be that desperate for her attention and companionship? The woman doesn't say a word. She keeps driving, passing her new home without stopping. She can't deal with this anymore. She glances at the rearview mirror, one last look at the cozy little house where she thought that she could start a new life. But she can't live like this. She keeps driving, and she doesn't look back. On the corner, the mailbox stands still and silent, as if it had never moved and never will. Dealing with a stalker can be a frightening and dangerous situation, but it can be even worse when your stalker isn't even human. That woman never had to see the mailbox again after she left the property, but the SCP Foundation is very familiar with this dangerously obsessive romantic, which it calls SCP-1269. SCP-1269 looks like a perfectly ordinary mailbox situated in front of a perfectly ordinary house somewhere in Massachusetts. It is made of black aluminum, possessing a red flag and a white plastic post. It stands at a third of a meter tall, and the house number of the corresponding property is printed on its side. It is unknown how long SCP-1269 has resided at the property, although dents and bruises on the mailbox chassis indicate that it's probably been there for some time. SCP-1269 remains a perfectly ordinary mailbox when its corresponding house is unoccupied or else occupied by a male resident. But when a woman, aged 23 years old or older, takes up residence on the property, SCP-1269 will start to manifest its anomalous properties. About two weeks after the woman moves into the house, SCP-1269 will start to manifest unaddressed romantic letters targeted towards the resident of the house. Surveillance within SCP-1269 has shown that the letters manifest approximately three seconds after mail delivery. SCP-1269's anomalous properties will manifest only when a single female, 23 years or older, hereafter referred to as the occupant, resides within the same property as SCP-1269. Approximately two weeks after the occupant moves in, SCP-1269 will start to manifest unaddressed letters every four days. The contents of the letter are romantic in nature and are targeted towards the occupant of the house. Surveillance within SCP-1269 has shown the letters manifest approximately three seconds after the occupant's mail has been delivered. At first, letters will manifest once every four days, but SCP-1269 will quickly escalate its obsessive behavior to the point that multiple letters will appear daily. The letters will become more obsessive and less coherent as SCP-1269's stalking behavior intensifies. When not under direct supervision of the house occupant, SCP-1269 will teleport to a location near the occupant and face them as if it's trying to watch them. It will always manifest in an area where it is partially obstructed, such as peeking through a window or behind some shower curtains. Sometimes, when the resident is asleep, SCP-1269 will teleport near the occupant without obstruction. SCP-1269 will not follow the occupant off the property, and all anomalous properties will cease manifesting if the occupant moves out of the house. Attempts to remove SCP-1269 from its location have so far been unsuccessful, 
SCP-1269 will teleport to its original curbside location after one hour of relocation. If attempts are made to replace SCP-1269 with a new mailbox, the mailbox will be teleported away with SCP-1269 appearing in its place. Approximately three hours after the disappearance of the new mailbox, it will reappear in a dumpster several kilometers away. Mailboxes recovered so far have all been found in varying amounts of disrepair within garbage bags and covered in obscene graffiti, as if SCP-1269 has become violently jealous of any other mailbox it sees as trying to replace it. SCP-1269 has also shown similar violent jealousy toward humans that it might believe are vying for the affection of any woman living in its house. In a recent experiment, a D-Class male was moved onto the property with the then-current test occupant, a D-Class female after seven weeks of residence. Interestingly, SCP-1269 ceased its teleporting activity in response to this male presence, but three days later, the D-Class male disappeared from the property, causing SCP-1269 to resume all anomalous behavior. Two weeks later, the body of the missing D-Class male was discovered in the same dumpster where SCP-1269 had previously disposed of rival mailboxes. The property where SCP-1269 is located is to remain under the custody of the Foundation, with one male researcher residing in the house to monitor the behavior of SCP-1269. Because of the dangerous lengths to which it will go to attain the current object of its affection, SCP-1269 has been designated with Object Class Euclid. It's our job to make sure it doesn't menace anyone else. The car screeches to a halt, the door swings open, and the doctor tumbles out. He lands on his hands and knees in the dirt and throws up the few remaining drops of stomach acid left in his system. He's put his hand in something sticky. He can feel an insect wriggling under his palm. Behind him, the door slams and a pair of boots walk around to his side of the car. The translator accompanying him does not offer a hand to help him up. It had been a long car journey with many similar stops. Fortunately, this was the last. The doctor gingerly gets to his feet and takes in his surroundings. He finds himself in a small village hidden amongst thick trees. He's not sure what time it is anymore. The flights, time zones, and car journeys wrought havoc on his circadian rhythms. He knows he is in China, somewhere very remote and very rural. He tried to look it up with the maps on his phone during the journey, but he'd lost signal a long time ago. One thing is clear, however. It is the middle of the night. The car's headlights are the only light source in the village. No one comes out to greet them. The doctor brushes himself off and turns to his translator. The man nods towards a small hut near the back of the village, just beyond the headlight's reach. His translator is a man of few words, both ironic and deeply unhelpful. The doctor does not know a word of Mandarin himself. In silence, the two men approach the hut. The doctor reaches out to knock, but his translator has already pushed the door open. Inside, there is just the dim light of a lamp. Almost everything is covered in shadow. It is almost dark enough that they can't see the cobwebs. Almost. Silken strings drape themselves over every surface, wall, and item in the little hut. It's impossible in places to even see what item of furniture is hiding beneath all of the webs. The translator reaches out to touch one of the webs in fascination, but the doctor grabs his hand, shaking his head. He hands the translator a face mask and a pair of disposable gloves. Annoyed, the translator takes them, but does not put them straight on, choosing instead to walk deeper into the hut. After a second, the doctor follows, only he can't help the feeling that something's not right. Something's missing. Here, says the translator. It is the first word he said in hours. He's standing behind a little curtain looking down at something, as the doctor joins him there and almost wretches from the stench. Lying in the bed is an emaciated man. He looks like he hasn't eaten in days. His wrists and ankles are bound tightly to the bed, so tightly, in fact, that his circulation has been cut off. The doctor can see right away the telltale signs of gangrene spreading across his palms. But they're too late. The man isn't moving. His bony chest isn't rising or falling. Worst of all, he must have been dead for a while now. There are sheets of spiderwebs draped over his sallow skin, like some kind of deathly funeral shroud. The translator mutters something in Mandarin. It doesn't take a PhD to pick up on the evident frustration in his voice. A whole night of driving out to the middle of nowhere for nothing. The translator kicks over a wooden stool. The sound is muffled by the thick layer of cobwebs as he storms out of the hut. But something is wrong here. The doctor can't walk out just yet. Toxicology. That's his field. Poisons, toxins, infections, bites. But that's the thing. There are no bites anywhere on this man's body. 
Head to toe, under the layer of spider silk, there are no welts, bruises, or puncture marks. The only darkened veins standing out are on his fingertips as they rot away from stagnant blood. Nothing to do with poisons. But there's something else, too. A hut holding a dead body, full of spider's webs, but yet, no spiders. A scream fills the hut. The bed rocks violently. The doctor looks down in horror to see the dead man is not as dead as he'd appeared. He thrashes this way and that, straining against the ties on his limbs. The doctor calls out for the translator, who appears at his side almost immediately. The translator shouts something in Mandarin, trying to be heard over the dying man's screams, but it's no use. The man throws his head this way and that, trying to bash his chin into his own chest or hit the top of his skull against the nearest wall. It is no use. The man opens cloudy eyes that stare wildly around the room, searching for something, anything that could help him break free from his restraints. Without thinking, the doctor grabs the man's head and holds it steady. He peers into the man's weeping eyes. Bizarre. If he didn't know better, he'd say they almost looked as if they had spider's webs built up beneath the eyelids, clouding out the man's windows to see the world. Small, silvery balls of thick liquid gather in the corners of them, too dense, too murky to be tears. From somewhere beneath the haze, the man's pupils find the doctor's. In an instant, his body falls still. It is almost as if he relaxed completely. A guttural murmur comes from the man's throat. The doctor looks to the translator for help. Free me. The doctor looks down at his patient. This is the part of medicine he had always hated the most. At what point do you let someone go? At what point do you say it's too late? Is it even right for him to make that decision? Looking at the man lying in front of him, a wave of sadness washes over him. His initial assessment had been right. It is too late. Even if he could treat the gangrene in the man's limbs with amputation, there's still starvation and dehydration to deal with. And then, the apparent venom from the spiders. Except, there are no signs of venom. Perhaps it isn't too late after all. With the right treatment, there may be a chance to… The man's wrist snaps, becoming a loose glove of broken bone that's easily pulled from the restraint. A foul stench of exposed rotten flesh hits the doctor like a slap in the face. He reels back in horror as the man pulls his other decimated hand free too. Unbound by his bed, the man lets out an animalistic roar. Sitting up in the bed, he tips his head back and starts pounding at it with what is left of his hands. Jagged wrist bones, barely housed by paper-thin skin, slam repeatedly into his forehead, harder and harder with each hit. The doctor is frozen to the spot, staring as the man smashes his own head. Skin splits, revealing white bone. Bone cracks. Then, with one last effort that seems to take every remaining morsel of the man's energy, he turns and crunches his fractured skull against the wall, caving the front half of his head in like a deflated basketball. Silence, more terrifying than any sound, fills the hut. The doctor stares at the body. An almost comical image pops into his head. The head looks like just a red plastic bag that someone had left on the floor, full of shards of broken pottery. He almost smiles. But then, the spiders appear. Just one at first, then ten, then a stream, then an eruption, spewing out of the gaps in the man's head like water shooting out of a collapsing dam. The tiny pink spiders flood the room, shooting up the walls into every crack and crevice, writhing and rippling around their feet. That breaks the doctor's paralysis. He and the translator sprint for the door. They crash through it and cover the length of the village in seconds. Grabbing the door handles, they haul themselves up into the 4 x 4 The translator slams it into reverse and almost crashes into a tree as he turns them around and back onto the dirt trail. They drive all through the night, not talking. The doctor gets control of his breathing, but his heart does not stop hammering the whole time. He cannot shake the images that fill his head. Spiders. Tiny pink spiders. Everywhere. The sun is just rising when the driver suddenly pulls over sharply. His eyes are wide, his face deathly pale. He doesn't say a word as he sits forward, reaches down the back of his shirt, and pulls out one tiny pink spider. The doctor yells in shock and hurriedly grabs a sample pot for the man to throw the spider into. The two men sit there in the front of the car in the warm morning light, staring through the glass at the arachnid. It looks soft. That's the most bizarre thing about it. Rather than having a hard, dark exoskeleton like other spiders, this one looks fleshy. No, that's not quite right. It looks fatty. It looks squishy like parts of the body that get exposed in traumatic crashes. Wrinkles and folds of pink, mushy cells with fatty deposits. Except it cannot be made from those kinds of things. It's a spider. As they watch, the spider seems to recognize their attention. It stands up on its back four legs and raises the remaining ones in the air. It looks almost as if it is doing some kind of 
mating dance for them. It turns its back to them, revealing a pattern of brightly colored dots across its abdomen. The doctor drags his eyes away from the dance. The sun is gone. Night has fallen again. His stomach stabs at him in hunger. But that can't be right. It was sunrise only a few seconds ago. The headache had started as he sat down on his flight. Now, five hours in and somewhere over an ocean, he knows he is not going to sleep tonight. He can't get the image of all those spiders out of his mind. He needs to report this. And he will, definitely, but not yet. A spider crawls up the seat in front of him. His heart stops, and he sits back violently in his seat, eyes wide. On the floor of the plane, pink spiders everywhere. They're not real. They're not real, just his imagination. He needs some rest. That's what he needs. He'll fly home, wait for the headache to pass. Then he can call someone. But right now, he just feels too groggy to do any of that. The adrenaline of his hallucination passes as quickly as it had come. He can feel the glass pot in his pocket tapping occasionally, begging for his attention. His head aches. He runs a hand through his hair. That can't be. Is he really growing gray hairs already? In frustration, he reaches up and taps at his forehead. Much to his surprise, the headache disappears almost instantaneously. If anything, it feels... good? He sits there for several minutes, drumming a couple of fingers against his forehead, and before he knows it, he's fast asleep, all his fears and anxieties long behind him. Only they are not behind him. Once he touches down, he goes straight home to his apartment. No spiders to be seen. Why not? Shouldn't there be more spiders? He certainly wants more spiders. His headache comes back. He drinks water, takes some medicine, goes for a nap, and turns off all of the lights. But nothing seems to work. Even the tapping stops working more spiders. A call lights up his phone screen, an international number. He takes a long time to answer it. It's his translator. The man's voice is shrill, panicked, far beyond what the doctor had ever heard before, even when they'd been running from the spiders. The translator is not making much sense. His words are slurred, and his sentences stop and start seemingly at random. None of it makes sense. The doctor turns the volume on his phone down. It's too loud for his headache, way too loud. Government knows. Should have worn gloves. Too late. The pain. The pleasure. Using a hammer. None of it makes any sense. The doctor looks down at his phone screen. The call is gone. His phone is dead. Hadn't it been on full a moment ago? What time is it? And where are the spiders? He punches himself in the head. A smile spreads across his face. He is in bed now. Something red around him. His pillow. It is soaked red. Could that be from his head? The sample pot sits on his bedside table. Only now... It's empty. How did that happen? Wasn't he standing in the kitchen a moment ago? He's losing time. He runs a hand through his hair. Webbing clings between his fingers. He sits under his desk with a hammer in his hand, euphoria washing over his body. Just once more. Eight more times. He hits the hammer against his forehead. Endorphins flood every cell of his body, so powerful he almost passes out as the pleasure chemicals crawl inside of him, oozing silk through the pores of his skin. Webs hang all over his apartment now. Just one more hit. Eight more hits. That feeling, it's just so... His wrists, his ankles. How many limbs? Four. Not enough. That light. Where is he? Figures crowd around him. It is hard to see them. Something's in his eye. Everything looks blurry and far away. The pain. The pain is back. His head. Someone, please. He screams and pulls against the bindings on his limbs. The pain. It's... It's impossible. He needs to make it stop. Just one hit. Just one more hit from the hammer. That'll be enough. Something is behind his eye. He can feel it. Something crawling on the back of his eyeball. But that doesn't matter. None of it matters, except getting his pain to stop. No more headaches. Just one more hit. That's all he needs. The hospital staff have never seen anything like this before. They're out of their depth here. In the dead of night, they arrange for the doctor to be transferred to a specialist facility in the back of an ambulance. It is a challenge to get him out of his bed, as the spider's web secreting from his skin have all but tied him to the linen. As fate would have it, a drunk driver gives the doctor his final wish. Not seeing a red light, the driver plows full speed into the side of the ambulance, sending it spinning off the road and down a hill, killing everyone inside, including the doctor. When police arrive at the scene in the early hours of the morning, they find the driver sitting on his own, staring at some small insect by the wreckage. The driver is unharmed by the incident. His only complaint as he spends the following night in police custody is that he feels a mild headache coming on. 
Anyone experiencing that headache is likely already too far gone from their exposure to SCP-632, an anomalous species of cognitohazardous arachnids nicknamed intrusive arachnid thoughts. Unconfirmed reports of mysterious spider colonies have been springing up across Asia, particularly in rural China, for several decades in connection with this anomaly. In 1972, the population of an unnamed town in the Anhui province were found to have been almost entirely wiped out. An entire town of corpses, each with their heads caved in, brain matter missing. With 106 dead, with 23 injured, this case is to this day the deadliest confirmed SCP-632 breach. Strange as it may be, physiologically speaking, SCP-632 could be considered cute. Their bodies are squishy in texture, bright pink, and are in fact made up of human tissue, brain tissue to be exact, coated in a layer of protective fat. As happened to our unfortunate doctor, SCP-632 reproduces parasitically within the human skull. The exact mechanics of this process remain unclear. It is believed that SCP-632 infects its human host through a selection of sensory triggers. Those infected have each testified to having been exposed to the following. Firstly, viewing the pattern on SCP-632's abdomen, exposed during the dance that the spiders often do under observation. Secondly, making physical contact with SCP-632. And lastly, through exposure to as yet unidentified chemical compounds secreted by the older SCP-632 instances. This is where luck was not on our doctor's side. He was smart enough to wear gloves during his encounter with SCP-632 in China, which may have been enough to protect him from being infected. However, upon his arrival as he fell out of the car, his hand landed directly in an SCP-632 web, housing a solitary live spider. If he had remembered his car sickness tablets, this could have all been avoided. Within three hours of initial exposure to SCP-632, the subject will start to experience mild headaches, followed by an uncanny sensation that their skin is growing silk. During this period, MRI scans have found that small filament-like structures start to form within the host's brain tissue. As these filaments multiply and spread throughout the brain, the subjects report developing an obsession with spiders. The brain tissue steadily deteriorates, leading to changes in personality and mood, as well as irrational behavior. Over the coming days, the headaches grow more severe as the filament cells press against the blood vessels lining the inside of the skull. Subjects find that they can relieve this sensation by tapping or hitting their forehead, replacing it with a pleasurable feeling as the filaments release endorphins upon impact. This is part of the sinister final act of SCP-632's reproduction. After six to seven days, as the host's headaches worsen, they find they have to hit their skull harder and harder to alleviate the pain and get that chemical high. Eventually, driven mad by the pain inside their head, they crack through their own skull. At this point, all of the gestating spiders that have been forming within the filaments in their brain, estimated to number between 80 and 200, can escape through the opening. Because of its unique containment difficulties caused by its cognitohazardous properties, SCP-632 has been given the Euclid object class. There is currently one live colony of SCP-632 stored in the biological containment wing of Site-52. The colony is housed in a small enclosure measured 20 cm by 40 cm by 20 cm and sustained on a diet of insects and water supplied through a vacuum chute. All personnel that work in proximity to SCP-632 are regularly screened. Physical contact with any SCP-632 is strictly prohibited, and all personnel are required to wear protective equipment and respirators at all times while handling live or deceased specimens. They keep a close eye on anyone developing any symptoms, especially headaches, the feeling of silk on the skin, or intrusive arachnid thoughts. The final bell rings, signaling the end of a new class's first day at middle school. A girl exits the building, her backpack slung over her shoulder, body hunched under its unfamiliar weight. It's been a long and tiring day. Her family just moved to this small Oklahoma town from the big city and, of course, she's spent every minute since then trying to adjust to her new surroundings. It's never easy to be the new kid in town. Right now, all she wants to do is to get home and relax. She doesn't want to think about school and its related anxieties for the rest of the night. As she walks down the stairs, she notices the school bus parked at the curb. Thank goodness, she thinks. I can't wait to get out of here. This day can't end soon enough. But for some reason, something about this bus sets her nerves on edge. What is it that just seems… off? There's nothing blatantly wrong with the bus, but when she looks closer, she realizes that it definitely looks a little strange. The different parts of the bus just don't add up. Some parts are new, clearly just off the factory floor, 
while others are battered and bruised from long-time wear. Some parts even seem to come from different makes and models of bus. I guess it's not that strange, she thinks. After all, her old school always had a measly budget. You could practically see the road through holes in the floor sometimes. Her new one probably just has those same issues. Aren't those problems all over the country, after all? The school probably just had to buy a dilapidated old bus cobbled together from random parts to make ends meet. And besides, she thinks as she watches her classmates pile onto the strange bus without a second thought, none of the other kids seem to think that there's anything weird going on. This must all just be in my head, she thinks. I'm probably just being weird because I'm so tired. I can't let myself become the new girl and the weird girl. The girl is startled as she hears a voice behind her. Hey! She turns and sees a boy that she recognizes. He sits behind her in class. They haven't spoken before now, but he seems friendly enough. You're the new kid in school, aren't you? He says. Yes, my family just moved to town. She tries to talk to him, but she can't help but keep getting distracted by the weird bus. Right, right. The boy glances at the bus, as if he can sense her discomfort with it. You worried about the bus? I was pretty nervous my first time riding it, but I don't worry about it anymore. You get used to it, he tells her. Uh, right, she says. The girl feels her cheeks going red with embarrassment. She doesn't want her classmate to think that she's scared of riding a bus. What if he tells the other kids that she's frightened of a bus ride? They're all going to think that she's some kind of silly baby. I'm not scared of the bus. It is just a bus, right? The boy grins, as if he knows something that she doesn't know. The girl doesn't want to admit her fear, and so with a defiant step, she climbs the stairs and enters the bus. Once she's on board, her unease doesn't go away. The first thing that she notices is that there is no one in the driver's seat. That's weird. Did the driver just step away to use the bathroom or something? It seems pretty irresponsible to leave the bus unattended. There's a line forming behind her though, so she doesn't have time to think about this. She takes a seat and stares out the window, keeping to herself. The boy from her class follows and takes a seat next to her. It's a little wild at first, but trust me, you get used to it fast. In fact, some of us think it's kind of fun now. The girl blinks in confusion. Who is this weirdo that gets such a kick out of riding the bus? She almost wants to snap at him, to tell him that of course she's not scared of riding the bus. She's ridden the bus hundreds of times back at her old school. But at the same time, there's definitely something weird going on here. And as much as she's trying to play it cool, she's clearly not able to hide her feelings. This boy can easily sense that she's uncomfortable. Suddenly, the bus lurches into action and pulls away from the curb. But wait, how can this be? She never saw the driver get back on board. The bus can't be driving itself, can it? She stands up in her seat and cranes her neck to see. Her eyes bulge from her head in fear and surprise as she realizes that, in fact, there's no one driving the bus at all. The driver's seat is empty and the wheel is turning by itself as the bus careens down the road. Who's driving the bus? She shouts, but the other kids barely even react to her outburst. Most of them are chattering amongst themselves, and only one or two turn to look at her briefly, before shrugging and turning back to their own private conversations. A chorus of giggles behind her alert her to the fact that she's just completely embarrassed herself. What's the matter, you scared? Calls an older boy from the back of the bus, guffawing loudly. Of course no one's driving. Don't you know anything? Leave her alone, says the boy in the seat next to her. It's her first time. She's never ridden the bus before. She's too panicked to correct him that, yes, she has been on the bus before, but not a bus like this one. What's going on? We're all gonna die! She cries, clutching at the seat in front of her in terror. Despite her fear, though, she can't help but notice that the bus isn't simply speeding into oblivion. The bus obeys all the traffic laws, stopping at stop signs and signaling before turns. It's almost as if the bus itself is alive and aware of what it's doing. That's just how it is says the boy next to her in a matter-of-fact voice as if he's anticipated her question. Apparently, this is a normal day for kids here in this Oklahoma town. The girl doesn't think she could ever get used to a bus that drives itself, but what comes next is going to prove to be even stranger. But you might want to close your eyes for this next part, says the boy. The girl asks him what he means by that, but before he can answer, she feels a strange wave of sudden nausea overcome her. Her vision goes hazy, and the whole world seems to waver in her sight. But the sensation passes quickly, and everything is quickly back to normal. Or is it? She turns to look out the window. The city passing by is familiar. She can recognize many of the same buildings that she passed on her way to school this morning. But now they seem strangely altered. The structures are in advanced states of disrepair, with broken windows and boarded up doors. The gutters are filled with trash and debris, and the streets seem to be abandoned. The bus takes a left turn down a side street, 
and the girl catches a brief glimpse of the town's city hall in the distance. She gasps. City hall is on fire, great gouts of hot red flame pouring from the shattered windows. Sirens echo through the air. The sky above is an ominous red, filled with angry storm clouds with jagged bolts of dry lightning dancing between the thunderheads, and she can see the funnel of a distant tornado making a touchdown in the hills. The bus briefly comes to a stop in front of the library, dutifully obeying a flickering traffic light. The library's windows are dark, but she can vaguely see shapes moving about inside. Electric sparks shoot from malfunctioning street lamps and downed power cables flail like angry snakes in the street. It looks like some terrible natural disaster has hit the city, but what could it be? Surely she would have heard some warning while she was at school. It wouldn't have just carried on as usual in the classroom while the world outside burned. She turns to the boy next to her, a fearful question on her trembling lips. He seems to know what's going on. Otherwise, how could he be so eerily calm while everything outside the bus is falling apart or on fire? What happened to the city? Was there an earthquake? No, he would have felt it. Was there a hurricane? Every possible disaster scenario runs through her head as she desperately tries to think of an explanation. But what happens next reveals to her that there's no natural explanation for the strange sights that assail her eyes. As she watches through the window, a squadron of armed soldiers march down the street toward the darkened library. Suddenly the doors fly open and people pour out, screaming as if they're being chased by some unspeakable evil. The girl expects that the soldiers must be here for disaster relief, but she is horrified when, instead of helping the escaping library patrons, they instead open fire upon the crowd. The girl screams in terror, but the other kids barely even notice. They're too busy talking or laughing. One kid is so disinterested in the spectacle outside that he's playing with a handheld game console rather than watch the carnage unfold. How can this be happening? Has the whole world gone crazy? She's filled with terror as she wonders, is the whole town under siege? Is her house still standing? Are her parents safe? Where is this bus even taking her? I told you that you might want to cover your eyes, says the boy next to her. The bus continues on its route, passing all sorts of terrifying sights. A parking lot has been transformed into a mass grave. She watches as uniformed police line up peaceful citizens against a brick wall to brutally execute them by firing squad. Mass riots are taking place in the town's central park. People are yelling obscenities and pounding one another into pulp, while armed law enforcement officers sweep in to escalate the situation. The air is thick with screams, gunfire, and the smell of burning bodies. The shopping mall is overrun with giant spiders, which chase screaming shoppers out of the exits. She sees rats as big as cars scurrying out of the alleyways, grabbing random people with their taloned paws and biting their heads off with their long, sharp incisors. On the distant hills, she can also make out the outlines of even stranger creatures that she cannot identify. Dinosaurs, aliens, demons. She doesn't come from a particularly religious family, but the sights that she sees today definitely make her think that she might be seeing a glimpse into the maw of hell itself. The girl has never seen anything so awful in all her life. To her surprise, several of the other kids cheer as the bus drives past a gaggle of walking corpses. They're mutilated and half decomposed, but somehow still mobile, shambling down the sidewalk and moaning. How can the other kids be enjoying this? Yeah, 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 chant the kids. Zombies, that rules. Maybe we'll get to see them eat some brains for once, cries the older boy in the back of the bus with sudden glee. What is going on? repeats the girl. It's just the usual bus ride, says the boy next to her. Don't worry, I felt the same way when I first started at this school, but it's really not so bad. I mean, it's kind of cool, isn't it? The girl opens her mouth to respond, but she's suddenly overcome with that familiar feeling of nausea. The world quivers briefly in front of her, and suddenly, everything is back to normal. The sky is clear and blue, the buildings are no longer dilapidated, people are bustling in the streets, going about their usual business. There's no sign of any of the horrors that she just witnessed. No fires, no soldiers, no monsters, and no zombies. The boy next to her commented that they must have been reaching someone's stop. From around the bus, she hears several other kids groan in frustration. They were hoping that they would get to see some exciting zombie carnage, but it looks like that show will have to wait for another time. The bus slowly comes to a halt, and the girl tenses as she hears the hiss of its air brakes. The door opens, and the girl realizes that the bus has stopped in front of her house. She's relieved to see that her house is standing, and she can see her mother gardening in the front yard, safe and sound. Was it all a dream? This is my stop, says the girl, standing up as if in a daze. Uh, the first time's always a little wild, says the boy as she leaves. Don't worry, tomorrow will be easier. The girl steps onto the curb and away from the bus. The doors close behind her, and the bus pulls away, continuing on its journey. 
Did you enjoy your first day of school today? Asks the girl's mother. The girl can only stare in shock as the bus drives away. What just happened? Did a self-driving bus just take her on a tour of hell before bringing her right to her own doorstep? Or did she really just imagine that whole experience? As you astute Foundation veterans have probably already put together, this new girl at school didn't imagine anything she just saw. That girl just had her first encounter with SCP-3583. At face value, SCP-3583 resembles an ordinary school bus, albeit one composed of completely random parts all held together by some unknown force. The bus is self-driving and in fact resists any attempt by a human to sit in the driver's seat. At some point, SCP-3583 became attached to a particular school in an undisclosed Oklahoma town for reasons the SCP Foundation still doesn't understand. Every school day, at 3.45 p.m., it appears outside of the school just as the school day comes to a close. The bus can hold up to 56 children and up to 8 adults. If it judges that not enough children have boarded, SCP-3583 will begin to honk its horn. The horn has a peculiar, hypnotic effect on all children within hearing range. They will be compelled to drop whatever they are doing and board the bus, meaning that the bus has some innate cognitohazardous properties. If the bus still feels that it hasn't reached its quota, it will increase the volume of its horn until it has attracted enough children that it can begin its route. Depending on how many adults have boarded, SCP-3583 has two distinct patterns of behavior. If four or fewer adults are aboard, SCP-3583 enters Behavior Pattern 1. In this pattern, SCP-3583 will dematerialize and enter a parallel reality called SCP-3583-A. SCP-3583-A superficially resembles the normal geography of the same Oklahoma town, with some minor but very important changes. The typical city landscape is replaced with a hellish alternative full of crumbling architecture, marauding monsters, shambling zombies, fires and natural disasters, and instances of military violence and civil unrest. SCP-3583 will travel through this terrifying hell dimension along normal bus routes, studiously obeying all traffic laws and pausing to re-enter our own reality only to deliver kids to their own homes. Interestingly, SCP-3583 only offers door-to-door -door service and ignores all conventionally posted bus stops. If five or more adults are aboard, SCP-3583 enters Behavior Pattern 2. In this pattern, SCP-3583 will travel to the sites of mass casualty events, seemingly arriving in the days or weeks preceding the incident, where it will circle the area for approximately 45 to 100 minutes. After this, it will enter Pattern 1, delivering each child passenger to their home before then delivering its adult passengers home as well. Known mass casualty sites visited include Pompeii, Nanking, and the World Trade Center in New York. Passengers inside SCP-3583 can take photos or video through the bus window, and all footage shot from within SCP-3583 matches exactly with archive footage taken at the mass casualty site at the time that SCP-3583 supposedly visited. However, SCP-3583 itself has never been reported by witnesses at any site or seen in any archive footage of any site. Luckily, SCP-3583 has proven to be a boon to this struggling school district. The school principal noted that SCP-3583 has a better safety record than any human driver. In addition, it never calls in sick and is never late for a pickup or drop-off. Every student that has received a ride in SCP-3583 has arrived safely, if a little shaken, at their home destination. And best of all, SCP-3583 is saving the school a lot of money on both driver pay and vehicle maintenance, money that the school has used to hire a new music teacher. The general consensus of the local community is that as long as SCP-3583 wants to work as a school bus and continues to do a good job, who are they to look a gift horse in the mouth? Although it still might behoove some of SCP-3583's more sensitive riders to shut their eyes and plug their ears until they get safely home. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-3583 when students began posting cell phone footage of their rides online. Although the Foundation has successfully scrubbed information about SCP-3583 from the internet, it has been less successful in figuring out what to do with the so-called school bus from hell. Foundation field agents are so far unable to explain SCP-3583's motive or operations. Conventional attempts to contain SCP-3583, such as impounding the bus or towing it to the junkyard, are futile. SCP-3583 will immediately dematerialize, falling apart into a rubble of disparate bus parts as the force binding it together appears to abandon this plane. However, SCP-3583 will always return the next school day, ready and willing to begin its afternoon shift.
Agents have considered closing the affected school, but feared that would only move the problem, as SCP-3583 would simply attach itself to another school. The SCP Foundation is currently monitoring the situation and has several agents embedded within the school district posing as regular staff. Because of this immense difficulty in containment, SCP-3583 has been given the Keter Object class. Considering the number of SCP anomalies that involve horrific bodily harm being done to their victims, it's honestly a breath of fresh air to be dealing with one this seemingly benevolent, a little post-traumatic stress disorder aside, of course. And while Hellbus may be what most around the Foundation have taken to referring to this particular anomaly, I'm going to stick to my own name, the Tragic School Bus. The High Priest, adorned in the finest purple ceremonial robes, stands before the great, bull-headed statue in the darkened belly of the castle. The year is 850 CE. Masked worshippers whisper chants of holy reverence on all sides. He is in his element. Everything they do, they do in service of the great god Moloch. All around them, banners bearing the sigil of the brazen heart hang. It's a celebration. Just a few hours earlier, their forces had invaded an enemy church in the hills. They'd slaughtered most of the congregation in a sudden whirlwind of bloody violence, staining their swords in the great Moloch's name. But as the high priest had ordered, some of these blaspheming Christian churchgoers were taken prisoner and brought back to the castle for questioning. Here, the high priest would deal with them himself. A sadistic, tooth-bearing grin crosses his face at the very thought of it. Soon after the ceremony, the high priest descends into the dungeon, which he'd taken with a certain flourish to calling the game room. Here, he keeps his private collection of torture tools from around the world each of which he takes great pleasure in using against the worms who refuse to bend the knee to his bloodthirsty god. In the game room, the air is suffused with a stink of blood and sweat. The prisoners who still have tongues start to scream when the high priest enters, knowing that everything is about to get so much worse for them. He's cultivated a certain reputation as a man willing to do anything to ensure the superiority of his infamous cult, the Brazen Heart. If ever you fell into his terrible clutches, escape was out of the question. The very best you could possibly hope for was a mercifully quick death. In the corner of the room, one unfortunate captive was twisted and shattered against a breaking wheel, but still torturously alive. In the corner across from him, another prisoner bleeds from the inside of a grimacing Iron Maiden that the High Priest had overseen the construction of personally. But that was only the very beginning of the High Priest's collection of terrible instruments. Prisoners teeter in agony on Judas cradles and Spanish donkeys. Skin is stretched and bones are cracked on racks. Some are pierced as they sit on the monstrous iron chair, while others simmer away in great vats of oil. Some scream as they hang from their wrists on the tenth round of strapado. Lead sprinklers, Spanish ticklers, thumbscrews, crocodile shears, choke pears, melee boots, heretics' forks, bastinado sticks, scolds' bridles, scavengers' daughters, the high priest has all of them, and he's adept at using them. But they all pale in comparison to his favorite piece, a prized possession, gifted from the bosom of Moloch himself, the liar's cradle. Such a perfectly ingenious tool for physical pain and mental terror, it's positioned at the very center of the game room just so every other prisoner and every other device can see him using it and know that it's their eventual fate. A mighty stone furnace with huge metal grates on either side. As the high priest approaches, he can see a terrified prisoner already writhing within the machine. When the prisoner sees him, the fear only gets worse. The high priest would have no mercy for him. He'd spent 10 hours on the braking wheel before this, and that felt like a pleasant sleep in a comfy king-sized bed compared to what he was about to endure. Two of the High Priest's sadistic acolytes jab at him through the grates with red-hot pokers. The High Priest grins and asks the prisoner what village he hails from. When the villager surrenders the information, the High Priest gives a sagely nod. He asks how old the prisoner is, and the prisoner says 27. Again, the High Priest nods. He asks the prisoner whether he would like to leave and be with his family again, and of course, the prisoner replies yes. He has no idea that they're all already dead. The High Priest smiles and says, Just one more question then, and you'll be free to go. What is my true name? The prisoner pauses for a moment, which earns them another jab with the poker. He tells the High Priest that he doesn't know. 
He's jabbed again and again and again. He begins to cry and starts apologizing. He doesn't know the high priest's true name. How could he possibly tell him, no matter how much he's tormented? The high priest says, Well, just give me your best guess. Who knows? Perhaps you'll be lucky. The game room falls silent, all eyes on the prisoner in the liar's cradle. His lip trembles, knowing from the dark legends what will happen when he answers. He breathes a ragged sigh, accepts his fate, and guesses incorrectly. Suddenly, the prisoner screams as he catches fire. The high priest watches with unrestrained glee as the prisoner burns. He does so for around a minute, the fire burning far more intensely than it possibly should have. By the time it's done, the pile of ashes that was once the prisoner falls through the grate in the bottom of the liar's cradle. The high priest turns to the rest of the room and asks, Who's next? Of all the many adjectives you could use to describe SCP-2128, also known as the Liar's Cradle, humane certainly isn't high on the list. This antique stone furnace was discovered deep in the dungeons of an undisclosed castle, believed to be a former refuge of a fringe occultic group known as the Brazen Heart, a cult of worshippers of the Canaanite deity Moloch, an entity mentioned several times in the Hebrew Bible. Among the deity's most notable traits is its bull-like appearance and the fact it requests burned human sacrifices. This feels extremely relevant, given the fact that the liar's cradle is all about giving its victims a fiery end. While the thaumaturgic methods used by members of the Brazen Hand to create the liar's cradle is unknown, what is clear are the cradle's capabilities and functions. When a human being is placed within the cradle and asked questions, a single lie will lead to them being anomalously incinerated. And the device's purview for a lie is frighteningly wide. A victim will be incinerated if something they say is factually untrue, regardless of the victim's personal knowledge. In other words, ignorance as an excuse will not save you. While the Brazen Heart was wiped out hundreds of years ago by soldiers of the Spanish Inquisition, the SCP Foundation has been able to glean some background information about the Liar's Cradle from a surviving document, a sheepskin scroll known as the Ignis Manuscript. This revealed that the cradle was invented around the 9th century CE, before being walled up in 1021 CE, and during its heyday, it was used as a torture device by Brazen Hand members against their enemies. While most torture is actually incredibly ineffective at getting information, studies have shown that under states of extreme duress, victims will simply say what they believe their captors want to hear in order to make the suffering stop. The Liar's Cradle is an excellent method of wringing information out of captives. Well, aside from the fact that one lie means the captive is immediately reduced to ashes. You see, SCP-2128 works on a true or false binary operating system that seems to imply an innate awareness of all knowledge. If you have enough captives to burn and know the right deductive or inductive questions to ask, it's possible to know almost anything in enough time. It's believed the Brazen Heart used the Liar's Cradle both for practical purposes and their own twisted amusement. Victims would be placed in the device and have their feet prodded with hot pokers while they were asked a series of increasingly probing questions about their life. Being forced to divulge extremely dark and personal secrets or meet their doom on the pyre. It was a depraved combination of physical and mental torture. If even hearing about all this makes you feel a little queasy, nobody could blame you for that. The SCP Foundation, however, looked at the Liar's Cradle and saw incredible potential. As mentioned earlier, the Liar's Cradle bases its judgment on raw factual knowledge, not the knowledge of its particular victims, so anyone with enough people to burn can conceivably work their way towards discovering any binary answer. And given that the SCP Foundation has an almost unlimited number of D-Class personnel at their disposal, it didn't take long for them to realize all the knowledge that was up for grabs. They just need to make a few sacrifices along the way, hoping to save more people in the long run. Moloch himself would probably be proud. It was this somewhat morally dubious chain of thought that led to the creation of Experimental Protocol 37 Sparafusil, the Foundation's plan to utilize the Liar's Cradle to discover more information that would assist in their mission to contain anomalies and protect the human race. The protocol is outlined in a five-step procedure that is as follows. 1. One D-Class employee, referred to as the Messenger, will be laid inside SCP-2128. 2. The Messenger will repeat statements as instructed from the prepared list. 3. After each statement, if the messenger remains unharmed, the statement is to be marked as true. 4. 
As soon as the messenger is incinerated, a new messenger is to be provided. The statement that triggered the incineration is to be marked as false. 5. A new messenger will be assigned. Repeat as needed. While the total extent of these tests remains off the record, the official files on SCP-2128 have some fascinating supplementals about some of the results of Experimental Protocol 37 Sparafusil. The first set of tests was designated EP-37 Sparafusil-22, Keter Checkup, and was conducted on January 10, 2014. The messenger in this case was D-6238. The first statement this D-class was fed was, the human race is in danger of extinction right now. Seeing as D-6238 didn't immediately go up in flames, this was found to be true. The second statement was, the danger comes from an item in Foundation custody. Much to the relief of the D-class, this was also found to be true, and he lived to make another statement. This statement was, the dangerous item in question is located at a site in North America. This was, sadly, the D-Class's last words, as this statement proved to be false and he was immediately burned to death for his troubles. The next messenger brought in was a woman now known as D-6239, after she committed an armed robbery that killed several innocents and landed her on death row. Her statement was, the dangerous item in question is located at a site in Europe. This caused her to be immediately incinerated. The SCP Foundation then continued to narrow their focus on this matter over the next 13 D-Classes. With the information they gained, they were able to narrow down that SCP-752, a subspecies of humans who are eager to displace and replace non-anomalous humanity, would be the cause of a containment breach that could potentially end the human race's dominance if they weren't stopped. D-6253 was given the statement, SCP-752 will breach containment within the next month. The answer was true. Next came, SCP-752 will breach containment within the next week. Also, this proved to be true. D-6253 would finally meet their maker with a false statement, SCP-752 will breach containment tomorrow. But this opened the door for the final correct answer delivered to us by D-6254, that SCP-752 will breach containment today. <gasps> Armed with this vital information in the nick of time, the Foundation dispatched MTF New 7, also known as Hammer Down, their largest and most well-armed mobile task force, to the site in question. This quick thinking allowed them to quell the threat at the exact right time and save the world from an SK-class dominance shift scenario that would have left humanity in the dust. Using the Liar's Cradle, the SCP Foundation had just saved the world as we know it, and all it had taken was a handful of D-class lives. So naturally, the tests with the Liar's Cradle didn't stop there. Next came EP-37 Sparafusil-23, Knowledge Measure. As the name suggests, this test hoped to ascertain the extent of the knowledge the Liar's Cradle possessed, seeing as it could continue to come in handy for Foundation purposes. The first messenger was D-7784, who was fed the statement, SCP-2128 knows everything. This turned out to be false and led to the D-Class's immediate incineration. However, the lead researcher on the case decided to take a different approach. Perhaps, he thought, the Liar's Cradle didn't accept the numerical designation that the Foundation had placed on it. The next messenger, D-7785, led with the statement, The Liar's Cradle knows everything, which proved true, because that allowed him to live long enough to be incinerated by his next statement, The Liar's Cradle will tell us everything. After his incineration, D-7786 stepped up to the metaphorical plate, first saying, The Liar's Cradle will tell me everything I need to know. The Cradle judged this to be true. It did not, however, take kindly to, The Liar's Cradle will tell the Foundation everything they need to know. It declared this statement false by immediately incinerating the D-Class. After this incineration, the EP-37 Sparafusil project was out of its daily allotted D-Classes and decided to call it a night. Their next test was the mysterious and controversial EP-37 Sparafusil-24 Sunday School Song which utilized D-7891 as its messenger. She was fed the statement, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. The results of this particular test have been permanently expunged from SCP Foundation records. Next came EP-37 Sparafusil-25, Pinocchio Paradox, which was an experiment intended to see how the liar's cradle would react to logical paradoxes. Spoilers, it doesn't involve as much incineration as you might expect. First came D-8232, who provided the statement, Telling the Liar's Cradle a paradox is dangerous to Foundation personnel. This was proven to be false, and ironically, he was burned alive immediately. 
Next came D-8233 with the statement, The Liar's Cradle is going to kill me right now. The Liar's Cradle bent its own rules by declaring this false, but only incinerating the D-Class enough to permanently disfigure him rather than killing him. D-8234 was shoved into the cradle after that, making the statement, The Liar's Cradle is going to burn me right now. This was proven through empirical observation to be false, 10 seconds passed without incineration. However, when D-8234 exited the cradle, he complained about sustaining a small cut on one of the rocks that made the cradle while climbing out of it. This caused D-8234 to rapidly succumb to a previously undiscovered form of gangrene and pass away in minutes. Finally, D-8235 entered and said, The liar's cradle is going to inflict physical harm upon me right now. This was proven false, and D-8235 climbed out of the liar's cradle unharmed. At this point, however, he began to cry and scream out the word, Goodbye, before dying via altogether more unpleasant means that I don't wish to discuss in great detail here. The last experiment we have on record here is EP-37 Sparafusil-26, Subjective Opinion, which intended to see if the Liar's Cradle liked to turn logical gray areas into logical charred black areas. Messenger 1, D-9224, made the relatively uncontroversial statement, Golden Retrievers are cute. The Cradle seemed to disagree, immediately incinerating him. The next messenger, D-9225, delivered the counterpoint, Golden Retrievers are ugly. And just like that, he was up in smoke. However, when Messenger 3, D-9226, delivered the wildcard statement, Golden Retrievers are tasty, everyone in attendance was surprised to find the Liar's Cradle completely agreed with this. When D-9226 delivered the completely understandable reaction, wait, what? That's freaking nasty! He was immediately reduced to ashes by the Cradle's flames. With this line of questioning concluded in the strangest manner possible, the new messenger, D-9227, was brought in. Before becoming a member of D-Class personnel, his name was Stephen Kemp, a cannibalistic serial killer who'd murdered and eaten 14 women before being captured, tried, and put on death row for his crimes. He delivered the statement, I'm a good person. Surprisingly, the Cradle felt this was true and let him live. However, when Stephen decided to get cocky and chime in with, Joke's on you, jackasses. Apparently I'm Mother Teresa. He was immediately incinerated due to the fact that he was not, in fact, Mother Teresa. His ashes were soon accompanied by that of D-9228, who made the statement, The liar's cradle is sometimes incorrect, before being burned to death. Next came D-9229, who allowed for the longest streak of unbroken statements in the history of tests performed on the liar's cradle. He said, The liar's cradle speaks only infallible, empirical truth. True. He said, The liar's cradle is hungry. True. He said, the liar's cradle's hunger can never be satiated no matter how full it becomes. True. He said, the liar's cradle would like to incinerate me right now. True. He said, the liar's cradle is growing impatient. True. He said, the liar's cradle sees delicious, warm meat on its plate and would very much like to be fed. True. He said, the liar's cradle is angry that it is continually denied its meat. True. He said, people meat is delicious. True. He said, I am delicious. True. He said, my skin is warm. True. He said, the crackling of fire upon boiling drips of fat and rapidly cauterizing flesh gives the liar's cradle pleasure. True. After such an incredible streak that also allowed for a frightening insight into the apparent personality of the liar's cradle. D-9229 was withdrawn alive. He was replaced by D-9230, who said, The Earth is round, and was immediately incinerated. It's widely believed that this outcome came from the Liar's Cradle maliciously interpreting Earth as dirt, rather than the planet Earth, just so it could incinerate the subject. Just because the Liar's Cradle is largely objective doesn't mean it isn't incredibly petty, it would seem. Because of the static nature of SCP-2128, it has been given the rare, safe object class. Containment Site 403 has been built around the castle that currently holds SCP-2128, and a healthy supply of D-Class personnel is regularly siphoned off for EP-37 Sparafusil. The sadistic sorcerers of the Brazen Heart may be long gone, but in a strange and disturbing twist of fate, the researchers of the SCP Foundation are keeping the spirit of their work alive even today. The old house has been abandoned for going on two decades, and as with any place that's been left uninhabited for this long, rumors tend to spiral. 
Of course, there are the more mundane explanations for why the two-story, four-bedroom home on the end of a nice street lays in semi-ruin. Black mold, asbestos, rising house prices. But those weren't the stories that most people told. Everyone in the neighborhood knew what really happened. All those years ago, the family that lived there had been murdered, and their killer was never caught. The three young paranormal investigators, with EMF readers in their hands and GoPro cameras mounted on their hard hats, know all about this. They approach the house in the dead of night, mumbling commentary for the recordings. If the old house really is as haunted as everyone says it is, then they could be in for something really good here. Their subscribers always loved brand new paranormal content. They use a crowbar to breach the front door and head inside. It's everything you can expect from a house that had been abandoned for 17 years. Dust, cobwebs, and graffiti abound, broken bottles scattered across the floor. Someone has scrawled, Welcome to Hell, above the door in faded sharpie. It all plays perfectly for the cameras. Paranormal content gold. All of them turn on their flashlights, generously provided to them by one of their sponsors, of course. But in this particular situation, they have no idea just how valuable their product really is. After all, there are some frightening things that hide in the dark. The leader of the trio begins ascending the stairs, narrating into his helmet cam, giving the more popular version of the house's legend. The perfect suburban family, torn apart, literally, by a killer hiding in their home. The family had all been brutally murdered by someone in their home, but the police never found any sign of unlawful entrance or exit. There were no clues to the killer's presence whatsoever, in fact. It was as if they were a ghost, a vapor. It was almost as though whoever killed the family had always been in that house, and even after the murders were committed, they never left the place either. As he tells the story, the lead investigator starts to feel a little nervous. Even though he himself doesn't really believe in the supernatural, he just plays up reactions for the views, he still can't help but wonder, should I really be here? Am I making a terrible mistake? Is there a chance that whatever did this all those years ago could still be in the house, waiting for me? But he pushes those thoughts from his mind. This gig is too valuable for him to wimp out now. And really, what are the chances that something actually dangerous would be lurking in the house? The other two investigators are still looking around downstairs, sticking together, their flashlight beams slicing through the darkness. Their boss always insists on going upstairs first. He demands the glory shot, after all. That leaves the rest of them searching the downstairs living room, dining room, and kitchen, where the best they can hope for is maybe a particularly haunted-looking dishwasher. It's why the younger of the two is so surprised huh? when they suddenly feel something happening to their body that they've never experienced before. In an instant, their whole body convulses with an involuntary shudder. They feel the temperature drop, and the world gets just that little bit darker. The best way they can describe the feeling is impending doom. Like any moment now, something terrible is going to happen. But almost as soon as the feeling begins, it's gone. Intensity dropping, the dread starting to dissipate, as though whoever or whatever caused this feeling literally passed right through them. Their fellow investigator asks them if they're okay. Of course, they nod and force a smile. They're fine. It's just a spooky place is all. Atmosphere like this would get to anyone. Meanwhile, the lead investigator is exactly where he wants to be ascending a rickety stepladder up into the attic, the very same attic where, all those years ago, the police had found what was left of the family. And from everything he'd read on the subject, their remains weren't a pretty sight, even by true crime enthusiast standards. He enters the attic and shines his flashlight around, capturing all the dusty old boxes left to rot in the cold. He's engrossed in the macabre spectacle of what had once been the worst and final moments of a group of strangers' very real lives. The attic is full of spider webs and shadows. They're so ubiquitous that as the lead investigator pauses to tell his camera the next chapter of the grisly tale, he doesn't even notice one of the shadows peeling off of the wall behind him. It wafts silently towards him, like a gust of midnight air. Little by little, the blob of shadow starts to take on a vaguely human shape. It leans forward in the investigator's direction, arms extended like a classic movie monster. Long, dark claws slide out of its shadowy hands. Downstairs, the other two investigators hear the most terrible scream. For a moment, the more fantastical thought crosses their minds. Could this be one of the tormented souls of the departed family, longing to be heard after years of silence? Then it occurs to them that they recognize the scream. It belongs to their boss. 
The two of them charge up the stairs, flashlights in hand, as the screaming starts to become more desperate than pain, like that of a wounded animal with its leg caught in a trap. Those terrible wails are echoing down from the open hatch leading into the attic. It's so dark up there, something must have broken his flashlight. That's when they notice something else. Red, dripping from the open hatch. For a moment, they hesitate, wondering what could be going on up there. Could they really help, or would they just be running into the danger themselves? But soon, their desire to save their boss's life overpowers their fear. They grab the ladder and start climbing, feeling the dripping blood on the worn wooden rungs. When they finally get up into the attic, it feels like the scream is coming from everywhere, bouncing off the walls in a terrible, echoing cacophony of pain. They turn in all directions, hovering their flashlight beams around the room in wide, sweeping arcs, until both fall on the source of all this terror. And when they see it, they can't help but scream too. The lead investigator's body is floating about a foot off the ground, his screams now fading into pained gurgles. Something huge and dark is lifting him up with one hand and sinking the long, dark claws of its other into his neck. The second the twin flashlight beams concentrate on the creature, it drops the lead investigator's bleeding body down onto the ground. His skin slate gray, his feeble twitching slowing to a halt as the last of his life drains from him. Two glowing red pinpricks open up in the face of the dark figure, eyes like terrible, burning coals etching themselves into their memory. Like smoke, it continues to glide backwards further, seeking refuge in the dark, a safe haven amongst the other shadows. By this point, the two surviving investigators know there's nothing they can do for their boss anymore. All that's left is to get out and survive. They have to save themselves. They turn, wasting no time running towards the exit. They don't notice it, but the second they turn the beams of their flashlights away, the shadow's terrible eyes disappear and it starts advancing towards them again, its claws outstretched and grasping for them with awful fury. The shadow creature grabs at their heads as they make their final leap for the exit. However, all the monster can pull away are their helmets and helmet cams as they scramble down the ladder and then down the stairs, running at speeds they didn't even think possible as the shadow slithers down behind them. It doesn't give up. It wants their lives. It wants their warm human blood on its claws. They clear the threshold of the accursed house and keep running to their car. One looks over their shoulder and sees the shadow leave the house, gaining on them, both claws outstretched and ready to rend their flesh. The two climb into their car. They see the shadow coming towards their window. It's moving so quickly, only a few feet away now. It's getting closer and closer and closer. Ignition. The car starts up and the driver smashes the pedal down. They take off, quickly accelerating up to illegal speeds as the shadow continues to chase, slowly getting smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror. A distant nightmare. A terrible, dark ghost. As it finally disappears, they feel a moment of safety. But really, only a moment. Because it occurs to them then that they cannot say, with any confidence, that this monster won't just be waiting for them when they get home. SCP-280, also known as Eyes in the Dark, is one of the more frightening and dangerous anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Of course, it likely won't be causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario anytime soon, but if you happen to run into this nocturnal monster, it's likely to cause an end-of-you scenario and remove you from the world with extreme prejudice. There's no way of telling just how many lives it claimed before the SCP Foundation finally got it into containment, and perhaps it's best to just not think about that. SCP-280 is a black, wraith-like apparition that floats at roughly average human height, with no visible legs or feet, as the lower portion of its body simply fades away before it reaches the ground. In its dormant state, the entity may appear to be little more than a shadow, easily dismissed, especially in dark environments. This comes as a natural result of the being's frightening ability to become intangible at will, and only become physical when it enters a state of active aggression toward a human target. In this intangible state, victims have even been known to walk through the shadowy mass by accident. While this doesn't lead to any detrimental physical effects, victims report that being inside the creature can lead to heightened states of anxiety, fear, and dread. Despite its body being wholly composed of an unidentifiable black matter, when exposed to light, the creature does begin to express a pair of glowing dots on its head similar to eyes, hence its frightening nickname. However, all tests indicate that these eyes aren't actually functional. Instead, they appear to be a kind of defensive measure, like false eyes on the carapace of an insect. These eyes are never shown when SCP-280 is advancing towards a victim, only when it is in retreat, though this is only one of the entity's several defensive responses. 
If an area where the creature is residing becomes fully illuminated, or a sudden flash of extremely bright light is directed against it, then it will immediately dematerialize and appear in a different area. The one positive thing that can be said about the hunting patterns of SCP-280 is that they're relatively predictable. The entity, it seems, only has an interest in human beings. When it selects a target, it will pursue them relentlessly, approaching in its intangible form with its arms extended in what many describe as a sleepwalker pose. In this state, you may finally notice 280's claws, long, thin, and razor sharp. It may silently approach while the victim is turned the other way, or while they sleep soundly in bed, or even when they're paralyzed in fear at the very sight of it. When SCP-280 closes the distance, it will begin to rip and tear at its victims with its claws, causing massive physical trauma and, in some cases, death. Attacks range from one to five minutes of being relentlessly clawed at by the beast. When the attack is over, it will simply expose its eyes, become intangible once more, and escape. You will not be able to overpower the creature. Foundation tests have shown that it has extreme physical strength, and it's capable of tearing apart solid steel with little effort. If it can't find any humans to victimize, then it will simply remain dormant, pressing itself up against a wall, in a dark corner, or within some other structure. Which is why, if ever you feel nervous about a certain dark corner in a room near you, it is best to remove yourself from the situation as quickly as possible and remain in a brightly lit area. It would perhaps be comforting to believe that SCP-280 is acting on some twisted form of animal instinct. After all, while the results may seem horrific to us, every organism has to eat, right? Well, sadly, that isn't the case here. SCP-280 does not appear to eat, sleep, or breathe to survive, and it never consumes any of the matter torn from its victims. The best working theory is that the entity simply enjoys the harm it causes, taking a degree of perverse pleasure in hunting down and murdering its targets. There is no better nature to appeal to here. The SCP Foundation's ability to study the creature's biology has also been stunted, in part due to the creature's highly aggressive nature, and also the fact that its selective intangibility makes gaining physical samples almost impossible. Even capturing and containing the creature in the first place came partially out of blind luck. It first came to Foundation attention after a series of mysterious locked door murders in a small Mississippi township. In the most recent case, an entire family had been brutally murdered in their home, leaving only one survivor. A traumatized nine-year-old boy named David, who'd locked himself in the basement when he started to hear the screaming. He was so terrified by the things he saw that night that he remained in a catatonic state for weeks afterwards, completely unresponsive to outside stimulus. But one little detail saved his life. A flashlight was clasped in his white knuckle grip, shining a bright beam of cold, white light onwards. When David was removed and placed into medical care, Officers began searching the building for any kind of clues as to how the other four family members were murdered. However, during this investigation, the police were just as vulnerable as the victims who'd been so recently slain. While one officer was wandering around the attic, looking for any evidence they may have missed, SCP-280 emerged from the darkness and attacked, tearing into his body with its long, deadly claws. Luckily for the officer in question, he survived the incident, though he was badly wounded. His report on the matter, including the ardent claim that he was attacked by a being, quote, made from black smoke, caught the attention of SCP Foundation operatives embedded in the precinct. They soon took over the investigation and descended on the house, hoping to tag and bag whatever had been behind all these deaths. This would be easier said than done. While Foundation field agents canvassed the home, they simply walked past the creature multiple times, discounting it as a mere shadow. After all, it only had these easily identifiable glowing eyes when it was in a retreating position. Even when it entered its physical state, operatives brushing up against it generally dismissed the sensation as hair, clothing, or some other object touching them in the dark. This already bungled investigation got even worse when the Foundation decided to introduce high-intensity lights into the equation, hopefully flushing the creature out. This, of course, only caused it to dematerialize and appear elsewhere. The chase ended in an almost farcical fashion a cavalcade of Foundation agents chasing a cloud of sneering black smoke across a Mississippi field at 2.30 a.m. Thankfully for the human race, the entity was, at the very least, eventually secured and contained. However, this wouldn't be the last time it was out of containment. During a series of tests with different types of illumination, intending to test SCP-280's reflexes, it disappeared from its chamber. It seemed almost to sink through the different levels of the illuminated site, before coming to rest at the containment chamber holding SCP-1591. This made for a fascinating accidental cross-test, 
You see, SCP-1591, to put it simply, is a unique sculpture of a star that emits an incredibly bright light, and this light will slowly make any being subject to its glow intangible, before disappearing completely. When SCP-280 came before SCP-1591, it displayed its eyes, but did not retreat. In fact, it assumed a kneeling position, and simply remained before the anomalous sculpture until it faded from existence. It then re-manifested in its own containment chamber several hours later without incident. All things considered, it went pretty well, as far as containment breaches involving deadly, human-hating monsters go. Because of its ability to demanifest and phase through solid objects, SCP-280 is incredibly difficult to contain, earning it the dreaded Keter object class. In order to avoid the risk of demanifestation, SCP-280 is contained in a 5 by 5 meter cell that is perpetually left in a state of total darkness. No equipment is to be left in the cell unsupervised at any time, and any items brought into the cell for testing must be removed when the testing is complete. Any staff members entering the chamber for tests must be equipped with infrared goggles, an infrared ID strobe, and also a strong flashlight to ward the creature off in the case that it becomes aggressive. If SCP-280 does attempt to attack anyone in the chamber, all attending staff are instructed to turn on their flashlights and turn the beams against the creature. No aggressive action is permitted, and staff members must remain at least one meter away from SCP-280 at all times for their own safety. And if you suddenly feel yourself getting a little nervous in an eerily dark room, I'd like you to remember this. The one thing more frightening than seeing eyes in the dark is not seeing them. A young man in a light t-shirt and cargo shorts pads down the worn hiking trail. It's a trail he's walked hundreds of times before, and as far as he knows, he'll get the opportunity to walk it a few hundred more. It's a smooth, even path, cutting through a lush forest on the edge of town, with plenty of nice benches and a few trash cans for dog walkers along the way. It has all the comforts a casual hiker can ask for. It's safe, familiar. He doesn't know why, but the young man feels like perhaps today is the time for a change. Maybe it's the subconscious will to avoid monotony, or the fact he read an article a few weeks back about how varying your roots is the best way to avoid being kidnapped. Whatever the reason, he stops for a moment to pull up his socks, takes a squig from his water bottle, and ventures out into the heart of the woods. Who can blame him, really? We all need a change sometimes. And it's not like this poor young man has any idea what's in store for him out there. His boots crunch on the undergrowth, small things skittering out from amongst the dry leaves and twigs. He always encountered other people on his usual trail, which was fine, of course. He didn't mind a little socializing on his walks. But there's something oddly comforting about the true loneliness you can find in the woods. It's just nature and you, properly acquainted. No screens, no keyboards, no emails, texts, DMs, or obligations. It's natural, the way things should be. The young man closes his eyes for a moment and takes a deep breath in, just to enjoy it. That beautiful, clean spring air. A pleasure money can't buy. When he opens his eyes, he notices something in the distance, even deeper in the forest than before. It's large and brilliant white. Some kind of structure. How strange, he thinks. There are no paths leading to this thing, whatever it is. How could it have been built? And why? Was it another one of those weird obelisks that appeared in the desert a couple of years before that he saw on the news? It's the most interesting little mystery he's experienced in a while, and nothing about it seems to be throwing up any overt red flags. What would be the harm in going a little deeper to check it out? The question would certainly stay with him if he never found out. As he approaches, he notices that it's a large cube made from some strange, glossy plastic. There are no gaps or rivets, no real signs of how the cube was constructed at all. The only thing differentiating any of the sides is a metal door on one of the faces. He circles the cube a couple of times, just to see if he's missing anything. Nothing really appears out of the ordinary, other than the very existence of the cube itself. He looks over his shoulder before approaching the door. No cameras, nobody waiting in the bushes to jump him. Not yet, at least. He steps forward, takes an uneasy breath, and opens the front door. It's a slow, cautious motion. After all, he has no idea what could be waiting for him inside. For all he knew, the whole cube would be primed to explode, with the opening of the front door being the activation mechanism. But no, what surprises him most is how oddly mundane the inside is. He takes out his phone, turns on the flashlight, and shines it inside. It's just an empty room. Pretty much exactly what you'd expect the least imaginative person in the world to suggest is inside a big plastic cube in the woods. Huh? 
Two strange little things catch his eye, though. Two doors on the adjoining back walls of the cube, a door to each wall. Huh? That can't be right. Doubting his own memory, the young man steps out and circumnavigates the cube again. There are no apertures in the back walls of the cube, so the doors inside would just lead to nowhere. Perhaps it's some kind of unfinished construction project, he muses. He'd read all about modular living and tiny homes. Maybe the plan was simply to cut in those two extra doors at a later date and fit in a skylight. People live in retrofitted shipping containers these days. Stranger things have definitely happened. Still, there it is again. That same nagging curiosity that brought him here in the first place. Even though he knows, logically, the two doors inside the cube lead to nowhere, he knows that if he leaves without trying them himself, it'd stick with him. He's just that kind of guy. The unanswered question weighs on him like a ship's anchor tied around his neck. It's always better to just… know. He ventures inside the cube again, lit once more by his phone's flashlight, and tries the door on the left. Even though he knows it should be a dead end, he still does it with that same trepidation as before, like there could be something waiting behind it, something with big eyes and even bigger teeth. He'll feel so silly for even worrying about this when he sees the wall on the other side. But that isn't what he sees. In fact, to his immense surprise, the door opens up into the interior of what seems like an identical cube. He's so shocked by the impossibility of it that he steps back, the door swinging back into place. No, 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 he thinks. That's impossible. He shakes his head and rubs his eyes. It had to be some trick or illusion. There's no possible way that this door can lead anywhere. He steps forward and, with great care, opens the door again. Nothing has changed. There's still an identical room to the one he's standing in, just waiting for him on the other side of the door. Huh? Maybe it's a projection or a mirror? Some kind of advanced AR tech being experimented on in the woods? The young man reaches forward. His hand slips across the threshold into the new room. It's real. It's an actual space beyond the doorway. There's even another two doors on the far wall. What on earth is going on? Wanting to be sure he isn't just going crazy, he leaves the cube one more time and checks the back walls. He runs his hand across them, smooth plastic, no seams, no tricks, nothing hidden. There is no explanation for what's going on in there. He's discovered something truly remarkable, an exception mm. to the laws of physics as we know them, an anomaly in space. The sensible thing to do would have been to leave that second, find somewhere with cell service, and call other people to come check it out. If that had been the case, then things would have ended very differently for this young man. Instead, he decides to play pioneer. If there are other doors beyond the one into the impossible room, where do they lead? Are there even more incredible secrets just waiting for him to find them? He doesn't want to just be the person who dialed in about the initial discovery, while other people took over and did the exciting parts. Chances are, if he calls in about this, some shady government group will come and take the issue off his hands. He'll never know the true secret. It'll nag at him for the rest of his life. And he can't have that, can he? Guided again by the light of his phone, he enters the cube. After checking that the door on the right leads to exactly the same new room, he opens the left door once more and proceeds through, letting it close behind him. He looks around the room. It's absolutely identical, down to the smallest detail, not a crack or smudge out of place. He approaches the doors and looks beyond them, exactly as he's predicted, and on some level, hoped. There are more identical rooms on the other side. There's breaking the laws of physics, and then there's dropping a nuclear bomb on them. It all begins to go to his head. As he passes through each door, the only thing that seems to alter is the placement of the doors on the walls. It seems a little disorienting at first, like the room is being spun around from below, but he soon gets used to it. It's strange. Going into a series of identical rooms doesn't scream exciting in the abstract. But when you know those rooms are impossible, it adds a certain layer of intrigue to the proceedings. Eventually, he comes upon something strange. After so long essentially seeing the same room repeated at him, he's primed to notice even the smallest difference. As he scans the floor with the light of his phone, he notices a boot print on the ground. It looks a couple sizes bigger than his own, with a completely different tread pattern. The thought dawns on him with a difficult mix of emotions. He isn't the only one who's been in here. And maybe he's not even alone in here. He's never been the suspicious type. He likes to see the good in everyone and assume a basic level of human decency. But something about the knowledge that another person could be in here filled him with torrents of icy dread. It's a dread so great that it even overrides his curiosity. He knows on some animal level 
that he needs to leave right now or something terrible is going to happen to him. He turns and it suddenly dawns on him. He doesn't remember which of the three doors in the room he entered through. In fact, he sped through so many rooms to get here, he can't remember which door he came through in any of them. The cold, thrumming pulse of dread soon heats up into panic. He tries to regulate his breathing. He needs to approach the situation logically. But how do you apply logic to a situation that's completely beyond it? He picks a door after an intense session of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and commits, heading through it into an identical room, and then another, and then another, and then another. He checks his phone, his only light source, and feels another spike of panic when he realizes just how low the batteries are. Who would have known how quickly the flashlight eats up charge? But without it, it's total darkness. He'll have no way out. He needs to get out before his battery runs out, or he'll never get out at all. Faster and faster, he passes through doors at random on the confidence that anyone who walks long enough will end up somewhere. He's looking for changes, landmarks, any signs of salvation. He finds, to his immense relief, that some doors have little red dots marked next to them on the wall in permanent marker. Whoever was here before might save him now. This relief has some cold water thrown on it by another scrawling a few rooms down. Someone had messily written, this is hell, on the wall in red, except this time, it wasn't a pen that left the markings. At the bottom of the wall, he can see a few bloody fingernail chunks sitting in a dry brown puddle. Had they gotten out, whoever they are? Or is their skeleton festering in one of these rooms? At this point, the young man is mortally terrified. Never before has death seemed like such a tangible presence, and not a quick death, but starvation and dehydration, two of the most terrible ways to go of all. He can feel hot tears running down his cheeks. He picks himself up, trying to choke out the sobs before they can rack his body. He needs to keep moving. Next room, next room, next room, next room, next room. With each one, hope shrinks and despair grows. There's no light, no progress, just the same thing over and over again. It's so relentless that, at some point, he needs to stop and catch his breath. He's breathing raggedly, his lungs burn, he's been getting nowhere at impressive speeds. It's only when he manages to slow his heart rate and quiet his breathing that he notices he's not the only one in the room. Their breathing is even more strained and wheezy than his. He turns slowly, almost paralyzed by fear, and turns the waning light of his phone into the corner of the room. There's a figure standing in the corner of the room. It's a person, but not the kind of person you ever want to run into. They're filthy and gaunt with deep-set wild eyes, their mangled fingertips, nails broken off, are crusted over in red. Their teeth, which appear long thanks to recessed gums, chatter against each other. I didn't ever think you'd find me, they say, voice a rattling whimper. Have you come to help me out? The young man doesn't know what to say. He's wrapped in a mix of pity and terror for the pitiful human being before him. How long had they been in here, just sitting in the dark, alone? The thought sickens him. I'm sorry, the young man says without thinking. I'm lost too. The stranger heaves a dry sob. No, I'm sorry, the stranger says. I'm just so hungry. Before the young man can say another word, the stranger is on him. They've got the strength of desperate insanity. Their bony, blood-stained hands clasp around the man's neck. The attack is so sudden, so shocking, so brutal. He screams and drops his phone. It tumbles to the ground and shatters. The horrors that happen next all transpire in the dark. The young man screams, but nobody with any interest in helping can hear him. Being trapped will do strange things to a person, but you don't need to tell anyone trapped in SCP-167 that. Also known as the Infinite Labyrinth, this anomaly is an absolute nightmare for anyone suffering from claustrophobia, the fear of enclosed spaces. Which is not to say it shouldn't also be terrifying to pretty much everybody else. The anomaly doesn't look like much to the casual observer, perhaps a work of avant-garde art or a particularly unwelcoming public bathroom. It's a cube measuring 10 meters around its edges, made from a shiny white plastic polymer with a large metal door affixed to the front. At face value, it seems to exhibit no anomalous spatial qualities, with the inner chamber having consistent internal dimensions with the outside. Two of the three remaining walls in the chamber display a pair of identical metal doors. Despite logically leading back outside of the cube, both of these doors instead open up to identical rooms, each of which also have two doors. This goes on, to the best of our knowledge, in perpetuity. 
Studies indicate that this anomaly has been explored extensively by people in the past, due to a high number of markings and unusual items from a number of time periods being left inside. Religious idols circa 500 BCE, several treasure chests circa 1500 CE, and even several SCPs, the specifics of which I am sadly not at liberty to share here. The complexity of the labyrinth isn't the only thing creating a risk of being lost within. All signs point to the anomaly having non-Euclidean geometry. Multiple researchers sent into SCP-167, each attached to the opening with a lifeline to prevent them getting lost, found that their experience getting to the same point involved passing through a number of vastly different rooms. It is currently unknown what causes these spatial distortions. Foundation researchers are extremely curious about potential connections to SCP-184, an object also known as the Architect, which causes notable spatial distortions inside any building wherein it is placed. Cross-tests between the two anomalies are currently pending approval from the O5 Council. Because the anomaly appears largely benign, one researcher even pitched using 167 as temporary storage space for low-risk anomalies. However, just because an anomaly is typically benign doesn't mean terrible accidents can't happen when the proper safety precautions aren't followed. The following note on the file from lead researcher Dr. Klein illustrates one notable incident of a tragedy as a result of lax safety procedures. As most of you are aware, an SCP Foundation senior researcher was videotaped entering SCP-167 several days ago without the requisite ball of twine, and he has not yet returned. His ultimate fate is unknown, but the search teams have turned up nothing. Let this be a reminder to all of you just how easy it could be to get lost in there if you don't utilize some method of marking your path. If I find that any other researcher has disobeyed the safety regulations and entered without a ball of twine, no matter how far deep they intend to go, they will find themselves being transferred to another facility for researching Keter-class SCPs, where they should have ample motivation to learn to follow safety regulations quite quickly. Signed, Dr. Klein. Because of its lack of sentience and static nature, SCP-167 has been given the safe object class. It has been removed from the forest and is kept in a padlocked room within Research Command 06, and anyone who seeks to conduct explorations into the interior of the anomaly must obtain permission from a relevant member of personnel with clearance level 3 or above. And remember, no matter where you're going, whether that be into the local forest or an anomalous cube, you're heading for disaster if you haven't planned how you're getting back. You're on your way home from work after having just finished working a double shift. It's late, and the interstate is completely abandoned, no cars visible either in front or behind you. It's only about a 20-minute drive, but you know you're going to struggle to stay awake, even in this old beater that shakes and rattles as it travels down the long, straight road. The rattling causes a piece of tape to fall off of the gauge cluster, revealing a lit, check engine light beneath. You grab the tape and put it back over the light, covering it once again. There, good as new. You turn on the radio, and it comes to life for just a moment before dying. You slap the radio and it blinks to life for just a second before dying again. You're about to slap it again when you notice huh? lights in your rearview mirror. And more than just a pair of headlights, it's a whole wall of lights. They're getting closer, and quickly too. Before you know it, they look like they're barreling down on you. But then they suddenly go black, blinking out of existence. Did that trucker just turn off his lights, you think? You have no time to dwell on the thought, because the sound of an explosion suddenly causes you to scream in fright. It sounds like lightning has struck just inches from your car. The inside of your car suddenly lights up with fire and smoke. Has your engine exploded? What's going on? No, it's not coming from you, it's coming from next to you. You don't know where it appeared from, but next to your car is now a massive semi. At least, you think it was a semi. The smoke is so thick it makes you cough and you quickly can't see. You lose control of the car and slam on the brakes, but you can feel yourself going off the road. As the smoke finally clears up inside of your car, you can see the moon. It's at this moment that you realize you're no longer right side up as the car flips and tumbles through the air. You open your eyes to find that you're still buckled into your seat. You release the seatbelt and drop to the roof of the car. You crawl out to find that your car slid to a stop upside down several meters from the road. You look around and far off in the distance, you can see it. The semi that ran you off the road, driving at an almost impossible rate of speed off into the night. You look back at your car, which is completely totaled, and wonder what you're going to do now. It's late the next morning when you finally get back home. 
the police did not seem to believe your story about the magically appearing semi-truck causing your single car accident, but they did at least give you a ride back home after administering a sobriety test. You enter your small studio apartment and look around at the sparsely decorated room, wondering how you're going to pay rent next month if you can't get to your job. You go to the fridge and open the door, but there's nothing inside except for a carton of milk that's well past its expiration date. You open it and take a whiff, but this is too far gone even for your state of desperation. You close the fridge and lean on the door, trying to figure out what you're going to do. You're so deep in thought that you barely notice the mail being pushed through the slot in your door. You decide to go pick it up, even though you know it will only be bad news. And you were right. Bills, bills, and more bills. First, second, and final notices. You wonder if you've ever had a piece of good news show up through that slot in your door. What's this, though? The last piece of mail is a battered and folded envelope that looks like it's been used and repurposed many times. It feels thick and heavy, but there's no information on it at all. It's completely blank. You open the envelope, and your eyes light up. Inside is money. It's a stack of crinkled old bills, different denominations, all in a random order, but there's a lot of them. There must be over a thousand dollars here. And there's something else, too. A note. You unfold the creased and dirty piece of paper to see a simple message that looks like it was hastily written in black crayon. All the note says is, Sorry about last night. Hope this helps, compadre. You flip the note over and look in the envelope again, but there's nothing else other than the wad of cash. The apology note may have been unsigned, but you weren't the first to receive something like it, and you would be far from the last. The SCP Foundation, though, knows exactly who sent it. This was a message from SCP-3899, also known as the Night Hauler. SCP-3899 is a black Peterbilt 379 semi-trailer truck with an attached trailer, but as you no doubt have determined, this is no ordinary truck. SCP-3899 has the anomalous effect of appearing seemingly at random upon stretches of highway within the continental United States and usually at a considerable distance away from any other motorists. The truck will manifest already in motion, traveling within roughly 3 kilometers per hour of the posted speed limit, but it will not stay at this speed. Once SCP-3899 has appeared, it will almost immediately begin accelerating, and the speeds it can reach are truly staggering. Despite appearing to be a normal truck, SCP-3899 is able to reach impossibly fast speeds, and it's been observed traveling at over 420 kilometers per hour, or 267 miles per hour. As SCP-3899 flies down the road, it will attempt to avoid other vehicles and roadside objects, and has even been shown the ability to displace itself across short distances, which it seems to mostly do in order to avoid collisions with vehicles. SCP-3899 will disappear and then immediately appear somewhere else, though always within 300 meters of its last location. This reappearance will be accompanied by a thick cloud of dense black smoke that lab tests have revealed to consist of a mixture of diesel fuel combustion byproducts, volcanic ash, and trace amounts of unidentified human blood. The anomalous truck will only appear at night and will demanifest completely once it encounters direct sunlight or if it causes an automotive accident, which it has done plenty of times. In one particular incident, undercover SCP Foundation agents working within the Virginia State Department of Transportation became aware of reports of a large black truck appearing on a particular stretch of interstate that had caused multiple accidents. They were able to track down and locate one of the victims of these incidents, a woman named Martha Lewis, who they soon brought in for questioning under the guise of it being a police investigation. The agents questioned Martha on her experience, and she explained her own interaction with the black semi. She said, it's all still clear in my head. I'm driving down I-64 on my way home and the sun had just gone down. There's no other cars and I'm about to take my exit when out of nowhere this huge truck just appears right next to me. There was a bunch of smoke, like it was on fire or something, and the sound was like a bolt of lightning had just struck right next to me. It all happened so fast. All the smoke clouded my windshield and before I could really process what was happening, I was plowing right through a concrete divider and into some trees. I think I passed out. When I came to, there were paramedics and cops. They took me to the hospital. The agents asked if anything happened after that, and she said there was one other odd thing. When she left the hospital and went home, there was a letter waiting for her, but it didn't have a return address. Inside was a large amount of US currency in a random assortment of denominations, with many of the bills appearing wrinkled and worn. There was a note in the envelope too, 
which read, I'm sorry, didn't mean no harm, for the damages, get y'all a new rig and drive on. Later Foundation analysis of the document revealed that the note was written with a piece of charcoal on non-anomalous notebook paper. Now you're probably asking yourself the same question that the SCP researchers had. Just who is the driver of SCP-3899 that apparently wrote this odd note and also paid for the damages they caused? The operator of the truck, which has been designated as SCP-3899-1, is a very mysterious figure. Observers who have been able to get a brief glimpse inside of the truck as it moves past them at a rapid speed have described the driver as looking only like a silhouette of a slightly overweight male wearing the type of headwear that is typically referred to as a trucker hat. Some reports have also alluded to the presence of what appears to be smoky, tentacle-like appendages within the cab, though all further efforts to determine the exact physical characteristics of 3899-1 have failed, as the truck has proved resistant to any kind of outside scanning equipment. Most of what is known about the driver has come in the form of direct communication, though not in the form of interviews or any other sort of face-to-face -face interaction. No, while SCP-3899-1 has never been willing to stop and have a discussion with Foundation agents, it does seem more than willing to speak with anyone and everyone in its immediate vicinity over Citizens Band, or CB Radio, which is a type of shortwave, person-to-person communication system that is popular with many long-haul truckers. In one particular instance, an SCP Foundation helicopter happened to be traveling above a stretch of road where SCP-3899 appeared. An agent within the helicopter began communicating with the anomalous trucker, first asking for their call sign, to which SCP-3899-1 replied, I'm a night owl and I'm coming in hot. I know y'all can feel this speed. After adjusting their volume to compensate for 3899-1's loud response, the agent asked if the entity could explain where they came from. 3899-1 answered with, I roll with the wind. My wheels sing sweet love to the blacktop. I'm filling y'all's veins with road salt and exhaust and the smell of burning rubber. Ain't no bother where I'm from. We all gotta live for the ride and die for nothing. I see, the agent responded before asking, Are you hauling anything in particular? SCP-3899-1 came back with, Ain't you listening, girl? You seeing this? What I got is pure rattling salvation. Eighteen wheels at a time. When y'all's roads is choked, when the ways is blocked and y'all's speed is all dead and gone. I'm dropping this load and we'll all be drinking gas and breathing smoke. The agent didn't understand, though, and asked again who they were and what they wanted. 3899-1 replied, This is for the souls of the road, for the long nights and dead engines, and everyone trying to put that horizon under their wheels. I am the roar of hot iron. I am screaming freedom. I am the death of all barriers. This rig ain't got no quit, honey. I do not stop. Can you feel the rumble? Can you see the fire and smell the burn? I know you can. I can taste your heart and I know you want to fly apart with me. When the agent began to answer in the affirmative that they could indeed, quote, feel the rumble, seemingly caught up in the excitement of SCP-3899-1's proclamation, the investigation was quickly halted and the helicopter broke off from its pursuit. Following this incident, the potential mimetic influence of communicating with 3899-1 is under investigation. SCP-3899, being currently uncontainable by any conventional means, has been classified as Keter. Upon reports of it manifesting, all CB radio transmissions emanating from the truck are monitored by nearby Foundation listening posts for attempted contact by SCP-3899 to civilian recipients. Any individuals who are contacted are to be administered Class B amnestics, as are any eyewitnesses of the truck itself. All information about SCP-3899 is to be suppressed, and a disinformation campaign is active to make all reports of a mysterious truck that can appear out of nowhere and move at impossible speeds seem like nothing more than an urban legend. Just what is SCP-3899? Is the driver some sort of anomalous ghost, or perhaps an old eldritch god, a manifestation of freedom and perpetual motion given physical form as a diesel-powered behemoth on the highway? Perhaps the answer to that question is up to you. Tell me if it starts to hurt, the dentist says before reaching into your mouth with a pair of orthodontic pliers and starting to pull your front teeth back into place. Evidently your screams aren't enough of an indication of the extreme pain you feel because he doesn't stop pulling. After what feels like hours of excruciating oral surgery, you're finally standing outside the dentist's office texting with a friend. Come on, show me, it can't be that bad, reads the message from your friend. You're nervous to send her a picture though, since you have a small crush on the girl and you don't want her to see you in this state. 
But after she asks you again, you decide to take a quick selfie and send it to her anyway. You snap a photo of your mangled mouth and jaw. The mess of wires had to be hastily applied to move your remaining crooked teeth back into place with blobs of fast-hardening epoxy, and the result looks like a low-budget horror movie prosthetic. You send the message and wait. You watch the dots appear that indicate she's writing a response, then watch as they disappear without a reply. You sadly slip the phone back into your pocket and begin walking away. As you make your way home with your head hung in shame, you keep your mouth shut tight. You don't want any passers-by to see what you've become. You decide to detour through the park to avoid any people as much as possible, and as you walk, you decide to stop at a picnic table next to a small pond. You sit at the table and watch the ducks mill about in the water. They have it so lucky, you think. Ducks never have to worry about their teeth getting knocked out by a baseball and leaving them looking like a monster. The ducks suddenly all start moving away from your side of the pond, eventually taking flight and leaving completely. You get the sense that they're trying to get away from something, and you turn around, but there's nothing behind you. Oh, it must be me, you think. But then you get the sense that there is something behind you, and turn again. Still though, there's nothing. It's just you, the picnic table, and the empty pond. You turn back to watch the still water, but you can't shake the feeling that there's someone behind you, and turn again. Hello? Is anyone there? You ask, but no one answers. You turn back to the pond and... You scream in fright at the thing standing before you and fall back off the picnic table. You get up out of the dirt and you don't wait to stick around to see who or what this thing is. You start to run as fast as you can, but you immediately hear it chasing after you. Instinctually, you take out your phone and start trying to take pictures of whatever it is that's behind you. You know no one will ever believe you and you want some evidence of this, this thing. You manage to snap off a couple of pictures, but you can hear the creature gaining on you. You scream as your mouth begins to ache. Perhaps running this soon after your surgery is causing your damaged teeth to shift and the pain is intense. It starts to feel like your mouth is full of jagged rocks, but you can feel that it is your teeth pushing out and stabbing into your mouth. You take one last picture before the creature leaps on you, sending you both to the ground and your phone tumbling into the dirt. Early the next morning, a police perimeter has been set up in the park. The detective arrives and walks past the traumatized-looking jogger who must have been the one that discovered the grisly scene. An officer guarding the site lifts up the police tape so the detective can enter the crime scene that surrounds a body lying under a white sheet. The detective asks the officer if they've found anything yet, and the officer hands the detective a plastic bag containing a dirty cell phone. The detective puts on a latex glove and removes the phone from the bag. The screen is cracked, but it still works. There's numerous messages on the screen that look like they're from someone trying to apologize for not responding sooner, and asking where the phone's owner is and if they're mad at her. The detective opens the phone's camera app and starts looking at the last photos that were taken. It's a strange series of pictures. They seem to all be selfies that a young man was taking as he ran through the park. It almost appears as though there's a figure behind him, but it's hard to tell. There's a foggy white vignette on the pictures that gets worse the further he looks slowly closing in until the last photo is nothing but a blurred milky white screen. The detective flips the phone over and looks at the lens, which you can see is completely covered in a hard white substance. The detective places the phone back in the evidence bag and kneels down next to the body. The police officer turns away. He's already seen the victim and doesn't need to again. The detective pulls down the sheet to reveal a truly shocking sight. The boy's mouth is a mess of teeth, far, far too many teeth. There are teeth growing out of every part of his gums at horrible angles, filling his mouth and jutting out at painfully odd angles. Who could have done this? What could have done this? The local police department may not have had any idea what the state of this victim meant, but the SCP Foundation did, because they had seen the same occurrence dozens of times before. In fact, they had seen it happen so many times that they had classified this anomalous entity as SCP-4910 but it had already earned a much more ominous nickname within the Foundation. It was known as The Grinner. Very little is known about SCP-4910, and eyewitness accounts of the creature are all extremely brief due to those who have interacted with it quickly succumbing to its effects. What is known is that SCP-4910 is a quadruped and appears to be made partially or perhaps entirely out of teeth. Those who encounter SCP-4910 quickly experience its primary anomalous effect, which is that it causes the extremely rapid overproduction of teeth in its victims' mouths. 
Existing teeth will quickly increase in size, protruding farther out of the gums than should be able, while new teeth will begin to sprout from any available space in the mouth, including the roof of the mouth and underneath the tongue. These new teeth will completely fill the mouth, which almost immediately inhibits their ability to speak or vocalize at all. The creature will then use this opportunity to attack and incapacitate the victim before starting to feed. Further adding to the mystery of SCP-4910's appearance comes from the effect it has on any nearby recording equipment. Cameras and other devices that come within SCP-4910's proximity will have their critical components compromised by a sudden appearance of a layer of dentin, which is the calcified material that partially makes up teeth. Interestingly, SCP-4910 seems to possess some level of intelligence, as it appears able to differentiate between normal civilians, who it hunts for sustenance, and members of organizations that seek to hunt down and contain or harm it, which it uses for an even more nefarious purpose. While the exact mechanics are still unclear, it seems as though SCP-4910 is able to infect certain anomalous organization members with its ability, causing them to act as a vector for the effect who then spread it to even more victims. This effect is, of course, of great concern to the Foundation, and containment protocols for infected victims have been hastily put into place. Should a member of staff begin bearing a grin with too many teeth or multiple tooth-filled smiles, they are to be immediately immobilized by any means necessary, though preferably with a firearm that allows one to keep an appropriate distance and hopefully prevent any further spread of the effect. The infected individual is then to be doused in a hydrochloric chemical compound that will reduce the afflicted to a pulp-like substance. Once this pulp is no longer animate, it can be transferred to the closest incineration site for disposal. Should a member of personnel have an interaction with SCP-4910 and feel that they were exposed to its anomalous effects, they may be saved by taking immediate medical action. Oral surgery to remove the additional teeth has been found to be effective when the procedure is undergone in the first one to two hours following exposure, though the victim will suffer lifelong permanent physical issues from the procedure. Once three hours have passed, the effect will have spread to the rest of the body, with teeth appearing virtually anywhere. Unfortunately for the victim, should the infection reach this point, pain management has been shown to be ineffective, and there is nothing that can be done to alleviate their suffering, save for termination. SCP-4910 remains at large and has been given the Keter classification. Mobile Task Force Epsilon, codenamed Turfing Black, is the only MTF authorized to respond to sightings and they have been given permission to engage the creature and utilize lethal force if necessary due to the danger this anomaly presents specifically to the SCP Foundation. Your phone suddenly vibrates. A text alert. Nothing too surprising about that. But you don't recognize the number. You open the message, and there's no text, just a picture. A strange figure dressed all in black, with a face that looks like the skull of a dog. Who sent this, you think to yourself? Is this a prank? You try to put it out of your mind and go about your day. The next day, there's another message from the same number. You open this one to find the same dog skull-faced creature staring back at you. But this time, you recognize the background. Is that your house he's standing in front of? Now you're getting a little freaked out. Someone is trying to mess with you, you're sure of it. But what can you do? Another couple days pass, and you get another message. You don't need to look to know it's that same number again. You've been getting plenty of these over the last few days. You're really scared now, and you run out of the house to your car. You've got to get out of here. You drive, and while stopped at a light, you decide to finally check this latest message and see what it is. It's the creature again, but this time, it's a picture of him sitting in the back seat of your car. You put your phone down and slowly turn your head. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1471, also known as Mallow version 1.0.0. SCP-1471 is a very interesting anomaly that's not really a creature or a monster or even an object. It's a mobile app. It's 9.8 megabytes in size and is freely available in online application stores where it's listed under the name Mallow version 1.0.0. There's no developer listed on any of the stores, and it seems as though the app is somehow able to bypass the normal application approval process and appear directly on the stores for wide distribution. 
Once SCP-1471 is downloaded and installed on a device, there are no icons, shortcuts, or widgets like you'd expect when installing software. It also does not appear on program managers, and once installed, it seems there's no way to remove it. Within three to six hours of installing the app, the individual whose device it is will begin receiving mysterious picture messages. All of these images will have one thing in common. Somewhere in the foreground or background is a large humanoid figure with a canine-like skull for a head and long black hair. This creature has been designated SCP-1471-A. Sometime during the first 24 hours following the installation of SCP-1471, the individual's device will start to receive slightly different images from before. These images still always contain instances of 1471A, but now the locations will be recognizable to the individual. These pictures will be of places that the individual regularly frequents, like their local grocery store, their school, or their work. These sorts of images will continue to be received until 48 hours since the initial installation has passed. At that point, the device will start to receive images of places that the individual recently visited, like an image of the restaurant where they picked up their lunch an hour ago. Just as before, all of these images have SCP-1471-A somewhere in them, as if it's been following them and wants them to know it. After 72 hours, things get even stranger. Now the pictures received by the individual will be of them in real time. They might receive a picture of themselves sitting on the couch, taking in that exact moment, except SCP-1471-A is standing right behind them. But when they look, there's nothing there. It's as if someone is photoshopping in this bizarre canid creature, but doing so impossibly fast. Finally, after over 90 hours have passed since the app was installed, the weirdness reaches its peak. The individual no longer receives photo messages, but instead will start to catch glimpses of SCP-1471-A in real life, either in their peripheral vision, in reflective surfaces, or in both. At this point, the individual afflicted will continue having visualizations of SCP-1471-A in the real world, a result that so far has been irreversible. Individuals who have reached this extreme stage of exposure have reported that the entity appears to be trying to visually communicate with them, but none of them have been able to understand or comprehend whatever message it's trying to relay. Such was the case with a subject named William. William had first been exposed to SCP-1471 at 15 years old when his sister, Sarah, showed him an app she had downloaded earlier in the day. The app's description states that you will never have to settle for awkward feelings of being alone ever again. That Mallow is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued, and that after just a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Neither William nor his sister knew how the app worked, but they assumed it was tracking them using some kind of GPS, and soon, William was receiving images from SCP-1471. The first one he received was of his school's courtyard, with SCP-1471-A, barely noticeable, sitting on a bench. He had black, matted fur, knife-like claws, a set of blank, pure white eyes, and a face that looked like the skull of a beast with a large, wolfish grin. William was immediately frightened by this, but Sarah insisted it was cute and funny. William wasn't so sure. The pictures continued over the following days, with SCP-1471-A appearing at his school, at his bus stop, on his street, nearly everywhere he went. And then, the pictures started appearing as if they had just been taken the moment they were received. William and Sarah were both being sent the same type of nightmare-inducing images, and they tried to delete the app from their phone to stop them, but they couldn't find where the application was stored. Then, things got even worse. The creature started appearing to William and Sarah in the real world. William, as it turns out, was the lucky one, as SCP-1471-A primarily appeared to him in reflective surfaces like mirrors, which he could cover with a curtain when he didn't want to see the strange dog skull face with its toothy grin staring back at him. Sarah was less fortunate. She saw the creature everywhere she looked, it always appearing just outside of her periphery 
catching glimpses out of the corner of her eye, or feeling it looming over her and watching her as she slept. William has been able to cope with the appearances of 1471A, even regarding it as a somewhat comforting presence at times. Sarah, sadly, was driven mad by the never-ending visions of the creature. Currently, the only known treatment to reverse the effects of SCP-1471 and the appearances of 1471A is to eliminate the individual's exposure to the images before 90 hours have passed after installing the app. Once those 90 hours have elapsed, though, it is too late, and SCP-1471-A becomes a permanent presence in the individual's life. Thankfully, 1471-A has thus far remained non-hostile and has not been shown to pose a threat to those afflicted by it, at least not a physical threat. All mobile devices that are found to have Mallow version 1.0.0 installed on them are to be confiscated and analyzed for any potential information as to who might have created the application, as well as leads for other devices that may have been infected. Following this investigation, the device's batteries are to be removed and the device placed in Storage Unit 91 at Research Site 45. Additionally, all online application stores for mobile devices are to be monitored to prevent unsuspecting users from inadvertently downloading the anomalous software. Any individuals who are suspected of having downloaded SCP-1471 will have their device targeted by a self-uploading malware that can disable it until it's able to be seized by Foundation agents. Due to the unpredictable nature of the anomaly and the potential sentience of the software itself, SCP-1471 has been classified as Euclid by the SCP Foundation and research into ways to hopefully one day contain the anomalous software is ongoing. You'll be starting out with cold cases, the police chief tells the detective who has just arrived for his first day at the precinct. We've got more than enough to keep you busy, so head on down to the archives and get started. The new detective is looking forward to taking on these unsolved crimes. Cracking the overlooked and long since forgotten cases is one of his specialties, and it brings him great joy to solve the puzzles that no one else has been able to. The detective heads to a part of the police station that doesn't look like it sees much foot traffic, where he finds the door labeled Archives. Inside the room, the air is musty, and when the detective sets down his bag on a table, a thick cloud of dust is ejected and makes him sneeze. He takes out the list of cases he's supposed to be working on and goes to a shelf containing rows and rows of evidence boxes. He pulls one down and starts looking through the files inside. It's full of police reports, witness statements, crime scene photos, and even bits of evidence. Hours pass as the detective goes down his list, looking through box after box, report after report. He finds that it's best to take a cursory survey first and see if anything leaps out at him, before drilling down to start combing through the details. As he pulls down the last box from his list of cases that the chief told him to work on, he notices something. High up on a shelf, nestled among the many identical cardboard boxes, is what looks to be a piece of leather luggage. He can't help but wonder what this is doing here in the archives. Is it a piece of evidence from another case that got left here for some reason? Or did someone simply forget their bag after they finished looking through old files? Whatever the reason it's here, he has a job to do, and investigating this bag isn't on his list. But then again, he knows he won't be able to focus until he knows what this bag is and what's inside. He'll let himself take just a quick peek, then it's back to work. The detective returns to the shelf with the bag. It looks like it's been here for a long time. There's a layer of dust covering it that's as thick as anything else in the room. He takes it down and blows the dust off the bag. He unlatches it, and inside he finds… a folder. Is this just another report? But what's it doing here? Maybe they ran out of boxes one day and someone decided to use an old briefcase instead. The detective takes out the folder and opens it. Just as he suspected, it is another case report. It's only a single page though, with several photographs paperclipped to it. He takes the photos off the report and begins looking through them. They appear to be numbered in order, and the first picture shows a mess of red liquid and chunks of what might be meat or bone. The next two show various angles of a badly mutilated corpse. It's been so violently mangled though that the victim is barely even recognizable as a human. The detective paperclips the photos back to the report and puts it back in the case. If this murder only has one page of evidence to work with, then he is classifying it as a revisit after literally everything else in the room is solved kind of case. The detective goes back to the last box that he was looking through and starts flipping through the case files again. 
but something about that leather briefcase and the photos inside won't get out of his mind. Maybe there is something there. Without even realizing it, he's suddenly standing over the case again. He takes out the report and starts looking through the pictures once more. Again, he sees the disfigured corpse from different angles, but the fourth picture is completely different. This one shows what looks to be someone's feet, but they're up in the air, as if they jumped and took a picture of their shoes. There's something wrong with the picture too, some kind of odd discoloration around the edges. It looks like an error occurred in the development process. Why would this be in a case file? It's tugging at his curiosity. But no, he really shouldn't be spending his time on this, not on his first day at a new job. The detective places everything back in the case and puts it back up on the shelf where he found it before deciding to call it a day. That night, he finds that he can't sleep. The detective keeps seeing the disfigured face every time he closes his eyes. And why the picture of floating feet? What does it all mean? His mind is racing, trying to make sense of it all. By the time his alarm starts beeping, the detective realizes that he hasn't slept at all. Later that morning, the detective is back in the chief's office again. The chief tells him that he looks awful and asks if the job is getting to him already. The detective does look terrible and something about the room is making him very uncomfortable. The ceiling feels too low, like it moved down a foot or two since the last time he was here. It's also very dim. Who can operate in such a dark room? He stands up and asks if he can turn on some more lights and before the chief can answer, he switches on more. The chief squints from the bright fluorescent lights coming on and tells the detective to get back to work and to make sure he gets some sleep that night. If he can't, then maybe this job isn't for him. The detective returns to the archives to pick up where he left off the day before and goes back to looking through the files on his list. But of course, that leather briefcase always seems to be right in his field of view, reaching out to him, begging him to uncover its secrets. That's it, the detective thinks. He has no choice. He has to know what's going on with this file. He takes the briefcase down again, opens the report, and starts going through the photos again. Three pictures of a gross corpse check. Picture four showing someone's feet. Nothing new there. Now it's time to finally look at the rest. The fifth picture is similar to the fourth, but the person's feet look a little closer to the ground. Wait a minute, are these in reverse order? He looks at the next. This one doesn't have anyone in it. It's a picture of a table, and it looks like there is writing on it, though the writing is very small. He leans in close and squints, but he still can't make it out. He runs to his own bag and searches around until he finds what he was looking for, a magnifying glass. He goes back to the picture, and with the magnifying glass he can finally read the writing. It's above you. He snaps his head up and looks above him, but nothing is there. He laughs to himself. Of course nothing is there. Maybe the chief is right. Maybe something really is getting to him and he isn't cut out for this job. But still, he needs to learn more. He looks at the seventh picture. He sees now that he was right. These are definitely in reverse chronological order. In the next picture, he sees whoever took the photos approaching the table in the room. In the tenth photo, he sees them walking through a doorway. In the eleventh, he sees them opening the door to the room. Finally, he comes to the last photo. It's a photo of the closed door to the room. There's writing on the door, and the detective can hardly believe what he is seeing when he reads it. The writing on the door says, Archives. The detective jumps up and spins around, but the room is empty. There's no one here but him. What's going on? Is this some kind of prank? He picks up the report the pictures were attached to. There must be some answers in there. The paper appears to be a standard police report that was filled out following the discovery of a homicide. The top of the page lists the address where the murder took place. It's the very place he is now, the police station's address. Next to it is the date. It's impossible though, the date is… today's. Archives can hold untold secrets, and many of those are often quite dangerous, as anyone familiar with the SCP Foundation is already well aware. Rarely is the file in the archive itself the danger. But that is exactly the case with SCP-767, a deadly series of crime scene photos that are anything but what they seem. 
SCP-767 is the designation for a series of anomalous objects which were recovered from a police department's own archives. They include a series of 12 Polaroid photographs, which have been given the designation SCP-767-1 through 12, that appear to be the source of the anomalous properties surrounding the objects. Each photograph is labeled 1 through 12 in the lower left-hand corner, though they appear to be labeled in reverse chronological order. When viewed in reverse, that is, starting with the picture labeled 12, the photos depict a first-person perspective of someone entering a room and examining a table. The table will have writing on it, which alternates between the iterations of SCP-767, and will either read, It's above you, or On the ceiling, written with a red substance that appears to be fresh blood. The next photos continue to be from a first-person perspective, and will show the person taking the photos being lifted up into the air above the table, with wisps of black smoke visible around the edges of the frame, that look at first glance like either photo development issues or damage to the picture. The final three pictures depict a fresh corpse that has been so heavily mutilated by lacerations that it is completely unrecognizable while the last picture shows a body that appears to have been virtually liquefied in some way, with gore and viscera spread around the room. The origin of these photos is unknown, and it's unknown if they were ever taken at all or merely manifested in some way. When the photos are taken to a new location and are allowed to remain there for one week, they will change to reflect a room within the building where they are being kept, with the individual portrayed in the photos being an image of the last person to experience the photo's frightening effects. More on what those are later. The ability of SCP-767 to change based on the location it is in is also present in SCP-767-13 and 14, which are the police report and the brown leather valise that always accompany the photos. The police report has an address and date at the top, both of which will somehow change to reflect the current date and location of SCP-767, while the leather briefcase has a gold monogram on it that will change to whatever the name is of the owner or head of the structure that it is contained in. But that is far from where the anomalous properties of SCP-767 end. Individuals who are exposed to the photographs will experience a wide range of effects that are based on how far into the photo series they look. Those that view SCP-767-1 through 3 will report feeling no special effects, besides the normal reaction one has to seeing a badly mutilated corpse, with most describing the photos as weird or disturbing. Those that view the photos labeled 4 through 6, though, will usually report that they have developed feelings of claustrophobia, with many also reporting a newfound bout of nyctophobia, that is, fear of the dark, or more specifically, a fear of the potential for bad things to happen in the dark. These fears will also vary in intensity based on how many of the photos were viewed. Subjects who are exposed to the 7th, 8th, and 9th photos will feel an overwhelming desire to inspect the ceiling, and most are observed snapping their heads upwards immediately after reading the writing on the table in the photo. In later interviews, subjects have described the feeling as instinctual or as if someone had yelled the words at them like a warning. Following this, the subject will experience a sensation of being watched and will usually report having persistent chills. Those who view the final three photos will appear to suffer a fear-induced paralysis effect when they attempt to move away from the photos. A shadowy, black, effervescent mass will begin to form on the ceiling directly above the subject, which has been designated SCP-767-15, though the presence of this mass has only been reported by in-person witnesses, as it doesn't appear on photographic or video recordings. Tendrils of the gaseous material will reach down from the mass and grab the affected subject, lifting them up into the air before violently attacking them. The subject will suffer deep lacerations as the tendrils cut into it before it completely destroys them leaving them as little more than a pool of blood and pieces of flesh. The nature of this dark cloud of gas, where it comes from, or why it engages in this behavior is currently unknown, and attempts to stop it once it has gotten hold of its victim have only led to those who intervene being pushed away by a powerful force, with all weapons passing harmlessly through the mass. In the time since its discovery by the SCP Foundation, multiple other unsolved cases of victims that appeared to suffer similar fates have been identified and investigations into whether they are connected to SCP-767 and the 767-15 entity are ongoing. The SCP-767-1 through 12 photos are to be kept inside of the SCP-767-13 report, which is itself stored within the brown leather SCP-767-14 valise, and the entire group is kept at an SCP Foundation Hazardous Items Secure Containment Center. Due to the little we understand about its nature or origin, 
The entirety of the anomalous objects that make up SCP-767, including the SCP-767-15 entity, have been classified as Euclid, and any access to the objects requires written authorization from at least one Level 4 Site Administrator. SCP-767 may not be the most dangerous file in the SCP Foundation's archive, but it may just be the most dangerous, literal file. It's late at night, and you're driving down a desolate stretch of highway somewhere in New Mexico. There's nothing out here except for you, your car, and the road. What you don't know is that you're about to encounter something. Something terrifying. There's no moon, and the sky is pitch black. Your own car is barely lighting up the dark road ahead of you. Just then, you spot something in your rearview mirror. It's a pair of headlights. There's nothing too strange about them, except that they are especially bright. Your eyes are so adjusted to the darkness that you have to look away. When you glance in the mirror again, you see that they're closer. Much closer. They must be going awfully fast. You don't know why, but something about the car behind you makes you feel uneasy. There's something off. You speed up a little. Maybe you can keep some distance from them. But the lights keep getting closer. So you speed up a little more. Still, they gain on you, growing bigger and bigger in your rearview mirror. You're getting nervous. They look like they are barreling right towards you. You floor it. The lights are able to keep up easily, though. And now, they're right on your tail. No matter how fast you go, they stay right behind you. The lights are so bright and close that they're almost blinding. You're in a full-blown panic. What is going on? Now the lights are swerving back and forth behind you. What do they want? You take a sharp turn without indicating, but they follow you without difficulty. You keep your foot smashed down on the accelerator. Your engine is screaming, but they just get closer and closer. They're right on your bumper. The bright white lights burn your eyes so bad that you swat at the rearview mirror to point it down. You look up just in time to see the deer standing in the middle of the road. You slam on your brakes as hard as you can. Your tires squeal loudly in the night, and you brace yourself to both hit the deer and get rear-ended from behind. You stop inches from the deer as something incredible happens. The two headlights seem to split, passing by you on either side of your car. You and the deer lock eyes for a split second as if you're both thinking, what was that? before the deer hops away into the night. You don't know what's happening, but you're not going to wait around to find out. You throw the car in reverse and hit the gas before whipping it around 180 degrees. You can't remember how far the last town was, but there's no chance you're going in the direction of those lights. You drive as fast as you can, checking your mirror constantly to see if anything is behind you. Nothing. Just darkness. Maybe you're finally safe. No, they're right in front of you. The lights somehow appear out of nowhere, right in front of your car. You turn the wheel hard to avoid a head-on collision and you go flying off the road, smashing your head against the window as the car goes flipping and rolling and tumbling. The car comes to a stop a hundred feet off the road, upside down, with a lone blinking turn signal dimly lighting up the surrounding field. A single headlight approaches the car, but it's not moving like a vehicle, it's moving like an animal. You're concussed from the accident, and your vision is starting to fade. The last thing you see is a second light approaching. The next morning, the local sheriff is investigating the scene of a single car accident. Curiously, there's no body, just a few scraps of clothing, and a pair of tennis shoes sitting neatly in the upside-down roof of the car. Strangest, though, are the childlike handprints all over the dirty car door. The sheriff doesn't know what to think. What the sheriff doesn't know is that he has just come upon the aftermath of an SCP-745 attack, a strange and mysterious creature known as the Headlights. SCP-745 is the classification the SCP Foundation has given to a bipedal, nocturnal predator whose hunting grounds are an abandoned stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745's most distinctive feature, by far, is its head, the top of which is a bloated sack of translucent skin, there are no visible sensory organs present on the head, nor does it appear to have a solid skull, and the creature's brain can be directly seen through the semi-transparent skin, which is covered in a web of bioluminescent organs. These organs are capable of producing a steady output of light that's been measured between 1400 to 3200 lumens, which is the equivalent of bright xenon gas headlights. 
The entity has been observed to have the ability to change the color of this light, as well as flash it in specific patterns. It is theorized that it engages in this behavior as a way to defend itself, and potentially may also use it as a way to communicate with other members of its species. The rest of SCP-745's body is covered in skin that is a deep, dark, black color that almost seems to absorb light. This quality, when paired with their blindingly bright head protrusion, gives the appearance of a floating point of light in the darkness. Because SCP-745 entities hunt almost exclusively in pairs, with their preferred hunting grounds being remote sections of highway, they are easily mistaken for oncoming or approaching headlights. Two SCP-745 entities are able to move together in perfect synchronicity, running in tandem at speeds up to 180 kilometers per hour. Together, they will target lone vehicles that they spot on the highway, and will begin to chase or run straight towards them, giving the unlucky driver the impression that a fast-moving car is rapidly approaching them. After they near the targeted car, they will attempt to stop it by any means necessary, whether by simply forcing the driver to pull over out of fear, or by running them off the road completely. Once their prey has stopped, crashed, or become otherwise incapacitated, the pair will stop moving together and approach the car separately to directly assault and then consume the vehicle's occupants. Next to no remains are left following an attack, save for a few scraps of clothing in the victim's shoes. Other than the damage sustained during the accident, there is never any other sign of struggle or forced entry, with the only other evidence left at the scene being the childlike handprints from SCP-745's small front paws. Strangely, analysis of SCP-745's genetic structure has revealed that unlike humans, they are not a carbon-based life form, meaning it is unlikely then that they are able to derive any nutrition from the consuming of human flesh. It is theorized then that they may be hunting solely for sport or some other form of perverse enjoyment. This question remains unanswered as currently there are no recorded observations of SCP-745 feeding in the wild, as successful attacks have never left any witnesses, and specimens captured by the SCP Foundation refuse to eat at all. No layers, nests, or other refuge of SCP-745 has ever been found, nor has the Foundation located any breeding grounds or young examples of the entity. It's unknown how or if they reproduce, or when they may have first appeared. What is known is that they had established a wide hunting territory across the American Southwest until Foundation teams began a program to thin their numbers in the 1960s. The effort appears to have been successful so far, and all recent sightings of SCP-745 have been limited to a specific stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745 has been classified as Euclid, and in order to limit potential exposure to civilians, the Foundation has purchased the land surrounding the highway with traffic being redirected to other roads. Foundation security teams disguised as highway patrol officers are to remove any trespassers or lost travelers who accidentally find themselves on the dangerous stretch of highway. The security teams are also tasked with attempting to capture any instances of SCP-745 that they can, and any recovered creatures, live or dead, are to be loaded into Class 3 BCU storage containers and transferred to Site-17 for further study. Containment procedures that are able to preserve living specimens are still being researched, and currently, no examples of SCP-745 have survived for more than a week in captivity. However, seeing as there have been no new sightings of SCP-745 outside of the isolated and monitored stretch of highway, and all reports of phantom lights elsewhere in the country have not pointed to evidence of additional SCP-745 outbreaks, they are considered to be effectively contained. A bear mauling you to death being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. 
Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent, and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature, so lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading, and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait! He has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right, and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. He doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop but it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. 
The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something to retort that he too was suffering all night, but he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water, and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this planned, and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there, freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps. He can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. 
All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being, as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell, and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site 88. With D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site 88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D-14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. 
The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site 88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlisle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlisle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattest production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flatus were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animals selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned-off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13 odor eaters are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this, due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2611, Large and in Charge.